Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. I'm also the CEO founder of Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we deliver HR companies with 49er for your people. Our guest today is Byron Robinson. Byron, thanks for being here today. Yep, of course. So this first question is probably the most important one I ask you all day long. Okay. Any new tattoos? No. No, no. new tattoos? No, no, no. I, um, I haven't, so the last tattoo I got, I think was, was something on my wrist or my, my hand tattoo. And that okay. was, um, that was 2019. Okay. 2019. And it's not, I haven't got any new ones since now because of any particular reason. Mm -hmm. Just, I just haven't been thinking about it. Yeah. To be honest with you. And, and I got, I got enough for a lifetime. I, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm probably done too. I mean, I pretty much ran out of tattoo ideas, you know, <laughs> there's nothing out there I really want to get anymore. Yeah. You have a lot of tattoos. Yeah. You, you have a lot of yeah. tattoos. I, I remember you were showing it to me. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm probably done. I may get my kids' names. Okay. Yeah, you'll, you'll, you'll do that. Yeah. You'll get yeah. your kids' names. Yeah. Outside of that, nah, I'm, I'm good. I, um, I am happy that specifically for the, the hand tattoo I got, I don't know if I told you the story of it, but I got it so that I would never be employed. Yeah. 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 And um, I, I definitely executed on uh -huh. that. But it was, it was basically just taking a bet on myself. Okay. And um, I would not advise anyone to do that per se, <laughs> but um, it, it, it worked out for me and reinforced, you know, where I kind of wanted to go in my life. Nice. And uh, yeah. So next, during the Olympics, did you have, did you get the itch to get back to the track or any field or anything like, did you get that urge again where you saw the Olympics going on? Um, naturally, yes. I mean, I don't think, I don't think that's ever not going to be the case. I'm always going to feel that way. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm a very, I would say a very competitive person. You know, and, you know, just looking at it, it'll kind of bring me back to like, like just little moments that you kind of forget over the years. Um, but to be honest with you, not, not only do I feel that way about like competing there, I, it's, it's ever more so now about uh, uh, doing things on the business side uh, with the Olympics, especially with track, um, the, the Olympic sport of track and field, because there's so much that can still be done. There's, st there's still so much that needs to be done. And, um, you know, the what was it, 20, 2021? That was supposed to be the 2020 Olympics. Yeah. When, I, when, I, when I first saw that, which was, that was more so like, you know, because I still had it physically. And while I still have a little bit left in the tank uh, uh, physically, now when I look at it, it's more like, oh, you know, if we could market, you know, athletes this way or bring in this kind of sponsorship to provide more value to the sport, uh, and, and, and that, th those were more of the feelings that I got this go around watching the Olympics, but I'm always going to watch it and, and think that I can be there again. So Olympics. So, so with 2020 Olympics being held in 2021 and then 2024, three years later, did that make, mess up like the timeline of athletes, right? As far yeah, as like, absolutely. Just, like, did that kind of mess them up physically or mentally or like, yeah, they, they probably were like pretty rigorous scared. Like, do they risk the race, this race? Yeah. I you know. So for me, after the the 2020 season got canceled because of COVID. That's when I retired. Um, and, and, you know, principally it was because I, I put, I banked everything on that season. Uh, you know, not just literally that year, but I would argue my entire life leading up to that. You know, the first team I made was, it was, it was, it was incredible. It was, it was, uh, I walked away from it. Like, okay, that was cool. I got my first one out of the way. Now the next team I make is going to be the one where I actually go for gold. And um, I would say in training, you know, I, I really, I really stretched myself in training to, to knock it out that season. So when it got canceled, I feel like I didn't have. So if there been no COVID go. 2020, you would have been on the 2020 team? Uh, well. Or at least competed for it? I, yeah, I definitely would have competed for okay. it. Yeah, for sure. I mean, um, yeah, that, that's what I was gearing up for. Okay. Yeah. But I don't want to take anything away from the people who who went through because yeah. you know I'm retired. I'm on the sideline now. I'm just I'm just spectating, uh, and I don't want to. I don't like the the retired athletes who become commentators and become overly critical. Yeah, and yeah. not to say that I don't I don't think that the athlete should be without critique. I just don't want to be that guy. Yeah, because you're always going to come off away, and I I understand it. I will even argue that I empathize with it. We already have enough of that, and I just don't want to be another one of those guys. Okay. Um, uh, pretty talk to you talk about you, you're planning to move to Texas pretty soon and get more involved with the University of Texas track team. Can you talk about that? Like you can be a mentor, a coach, like yeah. on, on the business side? Yeah. Um, well, uh, I, I, would, I would say that uh, I'll start with the ego reasons. Uh, I do want to be one of the bigger, the, the, the bigger donors uh, to the track program. 
uh, at, at University of Texas. Um, and as one of the, the past athletes there that went on to do, uh, uh, pursue a career in entrepreneurship, I want to be able to provide kind of like that bridge to the student athletes there so they can see, not, not to push them to be entrepreneurs, because it's not for everybody, but uh, to show them that, it, just give them the full palette of what they can pursue professionally outside of just what they already know. Because um, you can be successful um, in a career that's not the traditionally successful ones. Like yeah, especially now with all the NIL, NIL opportunities they have, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, now I, I do want to be uh, very particular about this. I, I, don't, I don't, I have no plans on being an agent uh, or a manager of anything of that sort. If, if I ever did anything in that space, it would be invested into an agency. It would never be me being an agent. Uh, I don't have anything against it. One of my, uh, my mentors is an agent. Uh, it was very influential in my life uh, and pushed me to where I am today, to be quite honest with you. Um, but, you know, it, I believe not just the Texas athletes, but student athletes in general need to see more avenues of what they can do past the sport. Out, you know, the untraditional things, because they already know salesperson, doctor, lawyer, um, coach. They already know stuff like that. But I don't, I don't know how often they see start an investment bank, start an investment company that's not real estate related or anything, you know, in that direction. So a lot of these, like these, they're kids, like 18, 90 years old, they're going to college and pay decent money, right? To play for, I think one time Nick Saban told, said on you on the TV show, like Bryce Young had a seven figure deal here to start a game, right? Do you think these young men or women are like financially are like educated enough to like deal with all this or they're dependent on their parents and, and people that like, might not have their best interests at heart? Yeah. Um, well, they're definitely not ready for, I mean, there's nothing that they could have done with, with exceptions uh, for them to prepare themselves for. Because if you even take away the money part, uh, talking about the student athletes right now, you take away the, the NIL uh, portion of it today, you still aren't ready because it's um, everything's new. And a lot of times, you know, their first generation of their family to, you know, to, to go out and, and, and do something like that. Um, from what I see right now, it's, it's the agents. Agents are now talking to athletes uh, at, at an even younger age. The, uh, and you can look at it as provide value to teach them, to, to kind of show them the ropes. Or you can look at it as exploiting them, to be quite honest with you. But, um, you know, because... I kind of feel for them. It's the wild, wild west right now. Uh, I, I, I'm of the personal opinion that, that more kind of regulation is going to come over the years. Because right now, it's, it's just kind of crazy. And, and speaking of Nick Saban, um, like you brought up, I mean, he was on record uh, for saying the reason why he retired was because it was just the, the sport of football, at least, was not, it, it had moved to a space that he doesn't recognize. I mean, it just, it was less about the value that the university would bring to the athlete and just about, can you start me? Can you guarantee me games? And how much are you willing to pay me? Um, it's from what I see right now, I don't see it to that degree yet in track, but I don't see why it wouldn't because the, the kids are running faster at an even younger age now. Yeah. I know. So recently, so the running back from Boise state, I can't remember his name, but he's like running like, Barry Sanders numbers. Yeah. The, and the guys asked him on this news thing, hey. A thousand yards, I think, in yeah, five games. Yeah. And they said, hey, like, we know, like, how much money you'll offer to leave Boise State to pay for big time schools, you know, like, lots of money. Why do you stay? He's like, Cause I want to build a legacy, right? Yeah. And most people are going to take the money, right? Yeah. Because, I mean, of course, everybody's economic situation is different, you know, sort of that. But he's like, yeah. Like, yeah. And by the way, I, I don't judge it either way. I, I under. As I get older, I'm starting to judge things less and just try to understand and look at the full picture uh, and, you know, use that information to advise myself on what I should do or with my family. Um, I completely get why someone would, would leave and just take the money, especially if you don't see yourself as going to the next level yeah. with it and yeah. you just, you want money. I mean, without it, you're, you're going to be hungry. It's, you're going to be a struggling uh, college student. And, yeah. and we all know that. And I also understand the person who wants to, to build a legacy and be the person at the university they at if it was a smaller program. Yeah. I get it. So chill off subject. So I wish I could remember his name, but the Boys State running back and Travis Hunter. Between those two, who do you think has the edge to win the Heisman Trophy? Right now, I'm Travis Hunter. Yeah, I do, yeah. Um, the stuff he's doing is like insane. Yeah, but I, I, 
I do want to be uh, certain on this, though. I think you should go to Archie, personally. Archie? Yeah, 100%. Of course you do. Well, um, well, oh, why not, why, why not uh, Evers, then? Um, well, Archie is, I mean, he's played more. Has he? Uh, yeah. I guess he has, yeah. Yeah, he has. Okay. Um, now, I, I believe, but we'll, it remains to be seen. I don't want to speak on what I'm hearing out of yeah. Austin, but we'll see who starts uh, in Dallas this okay. weekend. But um, I don't know why Archie is not in the conversation, to be quite honest with you. Maybe because he's a new face? Yeah. I don't know. But he's, he's throwing down. Yeah. Like darts down, down like 50 yeah. yards down the field right on the money. And he got his granddaddy's Archie Manny's uh, speed. Yeah. Like, yeah. like Peyton Manning said, the speed jig passed, uh, skipped me and he like, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he he's a baller. Yeah, he has some, he has some wheels on him. Yeah, yeah, he he he's a people don't look at him as a dual threat, but mm -hmm. I do. Um, he's balling. The team's doing well. The team's doing well. We have a, a very rough road ahead, though. Yeah, it's um, it was a wild ass week in the SEC this week. Yeah, it, no, to that because I was talking <laughs> funny enough because um, the CEO in in, in my company, uh, he's a big college football fan. So first thing we do on Mondays before we even work. We'll, we'll briefly go over like like things we gotta address as far as the company, but then we get right into the weekend uh, with college football. Um, Bama losing to Vanderbilt, so there, there's a few things to take away from it. I I don't want to be uh, everyone else that's almost pretend like Vanderbilt isn't a program like they don't train, they do yeah. the two a days and lead up to this, you know, like they don't have their own story. Yeah. Um, I think what what we witness is the fall. Um, of one of the great programs led yeah. by Nick Saban. Yeah. Because uh, Alabama has a ready-to-go roster to win a championship uh, as far as talent. Um, but what we got used to was the historic all-time coaching yeah. that he brought to the program. And what, what you're seeing now, not to take away from the coach there right now, but he's not Nick Saban. No. It's, that's just and, a fact. And who is, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, and what we're seeing is uh, the difference, you know, you, you have the ready-made roster. You don't have an all-time great coach. It's not yeah. the all-time greatest coach. And you're going to you're gonna see some volatility on a week-by-week -week basis. And um, it's sad to see. You know, I, I was telling my wife earlier, like, you know, when we, when, when we tell our kids how Alabama used to be, it's going to be hard for them to wrap their head around yeah. that because they're going to think, oh, it's just Alabama. Like, they're going to they're gonna look at the state, like, who lives in Alabama? Yeah, you know, also play there. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think it's behind. The best days are behind us now. Not to say they won't still win championships. Yeah. They'll or still win be competitive. Games. Yeah, yeah, they'll, they'll still be competitive, but the dominance. But like winning four championships in six years, those days are over with. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, it, uh, I highly doubt it. Did you see this? Where like after uh, you see a link Kiffin news conference, they just beat they just beat South Carolina, asking questions, had a TV on right. And like, it was like, hey, I don't mean any rude, but like, this is the one time last time we've been. I want to watch this first, right? Like, they, I didn't, they, I didn't see that, but yeah, I think, I think we game. all were yeah. kind of yeah. approaching it that way. Yeah, I didn't do anything on Saturday, but Saturday night at least, yeah. but but watch football. Yeah, uh, that was crazy. Yeah, that 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 was crazy. I do want to say though, it shows the dominance of Alabama that if a team beats Alabama outside of Texas, we didn't do this, but when a team beats Alabama, they storm the field. Yeah. Alabama wins, they just walk back to the bus. Yeah. You know, it, it but it speaks to how great Alabama Yeah. Was. Vanderbilt won. They tore down a goalpost, marched the goalpost three miles to downtown Nashville. Yeah. Storm the river, you know. Yeah. And um it's it was, you know, you you, you want to see people have fun, but I was just like, oh man, I I, I never want to see UT turn that kind of program. Yeah. Acting like that over a regular season game. I know we didn't do that in track. Yeah. Like we were we were expected to win conference. Like that just it's just what we did. And we'll enjoy it. Not not to not to say we'll be sour in the moment, but I'm not. I, I, it's not something I'm calling my parents about. Yeah. <laughs> you expect to win. I know, right? So uh, moving on. Are you still doing this Presidents Club? Your company? Yes. Can you talk about that? Yeah. Um, so for right now, it's 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 a consultancy. It's a consultancy that's wrapped into the investment bank. Um, it's it's going to be on a case by case basis, uh, and it's. It's basically for our clients. Uh, it isn't. It's not exclusively, but what it's formed into is for our clients that aren't yet ready to receive essentially big money, um, but they they know they will need it in the future. How can they get themselves there? You know, today, 
uh, whether it's managerial consulting or just fixing their capital stack mm -hmm. to make it more attractive for uh, a hedge fund or us to lend to them in the future. Um, so right now it's a consultancy and there's, there's going to be a Forbes like element to it, uh, that I want to keep under wraps right now, but, um, we, we want to both, you know, consult them and also highlight their companies to bring more exposure to them. And you don't want to drink anything? Are you good? No, I'm good. I'm good. good. Okay. During the day. Okay. We're during the day. Okay. Cool. All right. Um, and are you still like running track as workouts and stuff like that? Yeah. Um, pretty much every morning. Okay. Like, uh, this morning I did, um, it was sprints. I did um, I did two sets of uh, a two fifty one hundreds with a okay. um, a fifty meter walk in between. Uh, it sucks, but I, I just I don't know. I just love doing it now, it, and it keeps you in shape. It's it's like um if you do a sprint track workout, uh -huh. it's it's like uh, it's like the equivalent physically. At least it feels like. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm kind of exaggerating here, but like doing almost three days worth of of uh, weightlifting. Okay. It's like you're more cut. Yeah. Uh, it's it's very anabolic. It's a very anabolic thing to do to sprint at high speeds. And are you like tracking tracking performance? Like you're like, okay, I ran this 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 thing today. I need to improve next day. Do you think? Um, like that? I I don't do it in a meticulous way. Okay. Like because I mean I, I know what I'm doing, so I I can just do it all in my head. Uh, like I can tell you workouts that I've done up to like four weeks back now. I keep track of my cycles. Um, and I'm doing. I wish I did this when I was actually competing, but I do a much better job of knowing when I need to recover now. Okay. Because I'm, I'm almost 30 now. So I, I just cannot do, I can't train as hard as I used to when I was 20. I was, I was, I was an animal. Yeah. Uh, to, to my own fault. Like it, it, it hurt me more than it helped me. But psychologically, I just could not do that. I, I, just, I just always went balls to the wall. Um, so next, what is capitalism? What is capitalism? Um, I think capitalism... I would argue not what I think, what it is, is uh, it's an efficient way to distribute resources. Uh, like, well, I mean, what is it? Literally, it's a, it's a market system based on capital. You know, it's, it's, it's a way to distribute value to, to receive goods and services uh, and to exchange that value to the people who are producing it. So why do you think in the United States specifically, capitalism has, to get, has such a bad name recently, right? Like everyone's like, wants to get rid of it. They say capitalism caused all these ills and stuff, or to argue it's the best thing ever. Yeah. Want, like, why is the capitalist going to have like a bad moment right now, so to speak? Uh, I, it's the stage of where we are, and uh, at least for our country. You know, I mean, if you, this isn't the first time that a country started from grassroots, grew itself into a, a powerhouse. Um, and then became so powerful that the people within it fight. And then uh, young people who grew up and all they saw was the success of it uh, start to resent it. So they look at other places in the world and they start to question everything around it uh, only for the system then to follow in itself, to go back to the grassroots and, you know, just rinse, repeat that, that process over and over again. Um, and people just don't know any better. I mean, I, here's what I say to people who always, uh, and these are kids normally, by the way, um, that, that make those arguments. It's like, okay, well, what system do you prefer and why don't you put yourself into that system? Because they always say that like on an iPhone. And it's, it's like, it, you, you know, you, you say you don't, you don't like capitalism, but you just don't like looking at uh, the worst parts of capitalism uh, in a glass house. I mean, because you, you clearly love capitalism. You're, you're wearing designer clothes and you're saying it's on an iPhone. Um, it just doesn't make sense, to be quiet. This I don't understand. Like, you have all these people that, like, you know, they're anti-capitalist, pro-socialism. But then, like, if socialism is so good, why does all these immigrants come from, from, from Venezuela live in the United States, right? Yeah. Why are they trying to escape socialism and that failed system and come to the United States? That's one thing that I, just, I, I, I don't get. Yeah. You know, I commend you for even having a conversation with people. I, I, I'm open to doing here and there, for, just for academic reasons, for a thought experiment. Yeah. But whenever um, you see someone, like, really really engaged in that kind of talk. Um, I just, I just talk it up as this isn't a serious person. Yeah. And more importantly, they, they, they're trying to do that kind of conversation instead of actually competing in, in the market. Yeah. Um, cause you can, in anything, you can always just quit the game and complain about the rules or you can just learn how, how everything works and then see where you fit in it, you know? And 
I'm I'm not a revolutionary type. I'm just not. I'm not that. I'm not gonna. Um, you never see me marching anything or protesting a single thing. Um, I'll just learn like who are the players involved, how they operate, and, and what do I need to do to to further myself and my family, personally. So capitalism, it is a game, right? How does someone win in a game of capitalism? Oh, uh, well, produce value to the market, to the marketplace. And that, that can take place, like, it'll take the form of literally anything. I mean, there's people, I know people who make serious money on TikTok that make me think that, like, why am I doing this, this slow process, a sales process uh, business like uh, investment bank? Um, there's, I mean, you just learn how to make money. Now, I'm saying just. Uh, it's straightforward. It's simple, but not easy, you know. And you know, the 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 number one thing that I found the reason why someone doesn't uh, produce something to to make money in the marketplace is because simply because they don't think that they can. You gotta um, you gotta have what do we call it cojones to to really to to say you want to uh, like say bring in a million a year and then go out and actually execute on a plan that do it. Um, they just don't think they can do it or they don't see themselves as someone worthy of that kind of money. It, it's unfortunate. But there's a lot of ways to make money. You think, think that's because they're surrounded by the wrong people and they get the wrong mentorship, wrong environment, or is it something internally? Both. Okay. Both. I mean, because, I mean, we, we just talked about a million dollars. So if you do that, you're in the top 0.1%. Um, so it's, they probably think it's hard to get in contact with someone that, that can do that. I don't agree with that. I've always thought it out. I mean, I always went out of my way since I was in high school to, to talk to those kind of people. Not even to, for them to give me money, but just to understand how they think. So do you think they might be intimidated to talk to these type of people? Like 100%. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 100%. Because there's so many lies. Um, you know, I talk about this with my wife all the time. I, I personally um, am disgusted where the state of like the entrepreneurial meme culture is, where because it's like you see the same thing like every six months or so there's a new guy it's normally a guy there's some women too i just don't want to say any names but there's a new person that finds their way into one of your shorts all right and they're talking emphatically about something business related uh they're kind of quirky they uh i don't know they all kind of say the same stuff it's always like just just, just rinse and repeat it and you don't know where they came from. You don't know the business that they have. You don't know how many people they employ. You know nothing about them. But they're, they're the new guru telling you what you need to do to make money. And normally, it has something to do with buying a course from them yeah. or, or buying a book or something of that sort. Or, you know, going to one of their conferences in which they just upsell you, you know, ad infinitum. Um, and, you know, I can look at it now and just laugh about it because I know these people aren't. I, I know who you know, who, who the people that, you know, you should be listening to. And, but the issue is that there's a high schooler or a middle schooler or a very impressionable 22 year old that will look at that. And because this guru is telling them they, that the guru works 20 hours a day, they, they say, well, I get tired. I can't work 20 hours a day. I sleep for at least six. So it doesn't work for me. So then they think they can't make money. And it's ridiculous when you say it out loud, but that's where, if you don't have like a mentor that, that has been there and done it, that's what they're relying on. And it's sad because then the cycle just repeats. Then they don't make money. Then become a socialist down the road. And um, they end up having kids and just push that on them. So I think like back in school, we always, we, everyone knew someone like someone who would go, go to the grocery store and would say buy some lollipops for two bucks and then sell them for a dollar each, right? Yeah. But I don't think everyone, like most people don't think like that, right? I think it's entrepreneurial mindset, right? Yeah. Is that something that we can teach people? Or is this like either like, okay, you're the entrepreneur or you're not entrepreneurial? Um, perhaps. I mean, this is a heavily debated topic. Uh, it's funny because you asked it so casually, but like people really go back and forth yeah. on this. I, as I get older, because uh, I'm not old, but um, I'm basically 30 now. So... I don't know what it is. Something about like 28 or 27. I just started looking back like at my childhood up to this point. And um, I've always had the entrepreneurial bug. Like my uncle, um, he, 
he tells this story about how the first time that we met, I was like, I, I was five years old. And the first thing I asked him was, are you rich? You know, because I've, I've always had my mind on like just producing profit of, of some kind of way. Um, I, I lean towards that you just have it in you. But it's not to say that you can't make yourself an entrepreneur, but there's a certain like risk threshold uh, that entrepreneurs just you, you naturally just know how to live with. That's just not for everybody. It's, it's just not. It's just not for everybody. And so you're married now, right? Yes. You have a kid on the way? Yes, a son. What if your kid is not as driven as fuck as you? How, how are you going to deal with that? Um, he's just not. Okay. He's, he's just not. Um, I'll make him more that way just because it's just the nature of who I am. Mm -hmm. But I don't, think, I, I don't think you should change people, to be honest with you. I just, I just don't think you should change people. You should let people, you should lead people, guide them, but let them make their own decisions. Now, if he came to me and asked, Dad, what do I need to do to, you know, do X, Y, Z? Mm -hmm. And it was within my wheelhouse. And I, I, and I gave him, you know, I, I gave him a checklist <clears throat> to make sure he was sure that this is what he wanted to do at that given time. Then different story. Then I'd be pushing him. I'm going to push him regardless, you know, to be the best version of himself. Um, but if, 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 if it's just not him, it's just not him. I can't, I can't make him be that way. Okay. Uh, what do you think, though? Yeah, I mean, I think you gotta let your kids be your kids, you know, because you always want to be a better version of yourself. The problem is they need to be a better version of themselves, right? Not yourself, I think, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah. it, and I think too many parents like push their expectation on their kids, right? And it's tough not to do, right? Yeah. Uh, well, at least I can only imagine. I, I understand that, um, well, the best thing that I think that I can do to push my kids is to be the thing that I want them to be. Uh, with no words, needed after that just just be the man yeah and, and then they'll aspire to be that uh, at least for my sons um but i don't know i mean if <laughs> i don't want them hating me just yeah. because i push them so much yeah. and i already know out the gate they're going to feel something you know because i mean they're gonna look at their dad yeah and i mean you have a of things right you know like you're an Olympic track athlete you know they have to live with that you're Great businessman have to live for that, you know. So there's some pressure just involved with that, right? Yeah, or well, at least I would imagine. Now, I I think for me, I wouldn't I wouldn't feel it as pressure. I would just take it on. Oh, I mean, yeah, there's pressure to it, but I'll get excited about it. But I don't know his temperament. Yeah. You know, we, we got to see, and we got time. I mean, we have time to at least at least for me to um to get to that part. I mean, I just want to enjoy. Yeah, you know him as a as a yeah, person definitely. as a human being. Yeah. You know. It, it, you know, a smiling child in this world that's just, it just loves everything. I, I want to enjoy that part first. And then as he uh, matures into, you know, someone with their own thoughts and, you know, way of, of navigating the world, then kind of see where it goes from there. But I, I don't want to do too much though. Cause I just, I don't like, I don't like when people do it to me. Yeah. I mean, I, I think the number one thing that I needed was less of everything. I just, cause I already had it. So I, I didn't need people trying to, trying to bring it out of me. I, I just I, I just needed them to leave me alone <laughs> and let me do my thing. Yeah, I know that's a big deal too. Um, is money real? Like, and if it's real, how can we just print out trillions of dollars of money like it's nothing? Like, is the concept real? Is the money is like is it just a made up concept? Is like, yeah. Um. Well, no. Well, currency currency is not real. Oh, well, I mean, currency is just a way to display value. Um, and even like back in the COVID era, they they pr they printed. Tech, okay, I mean, they did they did create money because because they they bought treasuries in mass that they could then use to basically convert in, into the currency. Um, but you can you can you can print currency. You can't print value. Um, so I mean, it's 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 a there's a gray area there. I mean, money is real because like if 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 I wanted to sell you this Texas hat uh, for an iPhone. Um, I would have to basically give you a bunch of hats for the iPhone and money is just a way to say, okay, well, the value of these hats is, is this, and I'm going to display it with this, you know, as an intermediate. Um, and I'll just give you that instead for the iPhone. I mean, that's, that's all that money is. Um, now it is now it, it came about backed by a uh, gold completely. Uh, but once, once we became off of the gold standard, 
not so much. Um, but the government prints, they technically print money. They can print money. Uh, there's a very convoluted process of doing that. They can print money, but it can't print value. And they can give you all the money in the world, but if it's worthless, I mean, would you take Venezuela? Would you take a million dollar in whatever the currency that, that Venezuela uses? Yeah, I mean, of course no, not. No way, no. Yeah, because it has no value no. to it. And our, I mean, and not to go all the way down that rabbit hole, but only reason why our money still has value now is because we we off we offshore the uh, the inflation to other countries, essentially. Is this true? I think I'll probably make this up, but something like the value of the United States dollars was eighty percent or something. That was down to seventy percent, or is it like the cost or the value is degrading versus a war currency or something like that? What do you mean? What do you mean? I I, so, so, I, I think I know what you're saying. So but I think back back in the day, like a dollar was really worth eighty cents. Mm -hmm. And compared to other markets, now it's down to like sixty five percent or something like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since like the thirties or something, I think so. Around yeah. there, yeah, yeah. Because uh, of inflation. Yeah, yeah. Which, uh, again, I'm I'm no economist. I'm a banker. Um, so I, I try not to, you know, I, I try to speak, you know, for what it is and not my personal input. Um, but you can make a case that you need inflation, especially as you have more people and. Uh, you you need inflation to coincide essentially with the growth of GDP of your country. Because you don't want a situation where you have the capacity to produce a lot, but you don't have enough money. Um, that's deflation. You don't want that. No, no. But, you, but you don't want what we've been experiencing, too much of the opposite of that, too. Not enough goods and services and too much money. But then the price of everything goes up. Uh, so you got to find a middle ground. But you... If you look at it that way, because population growth I mean, has been happening since the beginning of time, um, barring any kind of you know exotic event, so you you do need inflation to to kind of keep track with that, so you can keep growing your GDP to a certain degree. Uh, but it can't be out of whack. Okay. Do you think we should go back to the gold standard? Um, do I think? We or does should... that or does that really matter? Um, I'm in favor of a gold standard. Uh, but so, so what I really what only time backs up the money now is like U.S. government, right? Right now, yeah, the, the, yeah. Our, our money, I mean, money is credit, so it's, it's backed by the full faith of the government ability to repay it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the issue with going back to the gold standard today is that the deflation would essentially bankrupt us. Okay. I mean, people would you've inflation is bad, especially the inflation that that we've been feeling. But it would be a lot worse if we experienced the equivalent rate. Of okay. deflation, um, it's it's a bad thing, it, and I think ultimately that's what the government wants to avoid the, the most is deflation. Okay, so does that really matter in the big scheme of things? If you're in debt, whether as an individual person or as a company, does that really matter? If yeah. you're like in debt, yeah, yeah, yeah. How does that it, matter? Like, is it a bad thing? Can it ever be a good thing? Oh, uh, it depends on what the debt. If it's consumer debt, that personally, because I'm. I'm fiscally conservative, so I mean, if it's I, I don't I don't spend I don't use credit for like TVs and clothes and stuff. Um, if you're using debt to purchase an asset and it, and that asset yields a return higher than the interest on the debt, then I mean, you're getting good return on equity. I would I would assume at least. Um, yeah, I mean, debt. We wouldn't be where we are right now as a country without debt. Um, I mean, point blank. Period. That's just that's a fact. That's that's what it is. Um, when a bank extends you money, I mean that that's that's debt. Uh, any kind of money a bank extends you, by the way, is credit. Um, and we just wouldn't be here without it. I just, as long as that is used for assets, though. But people use debt for things that have nothing to do with actually making money. They, I mean, they use it for the most silliest of things. There, there's kids that wear the shoes that I'm wearing right now, um, and they buy it completely just. On, on a credit card that's crazy to me that's that's bizarre because i would never do that personally um what's your take on the recent interest rate um i can't think of a word uh, not a hype but like the other the other thing like um decrease. decrease yeah De decrease, decrease. Do, um do you think they went far enough they should have decreased it by more um here I have to opt out. I have to I have to say I'm a banker, so I, okay. I, 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 I can't, you know, I can't tell you my opinion on it. Okay. Um, but I will say that 
Uh, it remains to be seen if there will be more decreases for the remainder of the year. Do you think the time is right for the decrease? Um, it depends on what the Fed is trying to do. Um, now the latest uh, payroll uh, numbers that came out showed an increase. So, I mean, you can make a case that they actually decreased rates too early, to be honest with you, because you, know, they, they, you don't want a situation like that because then the, the labor market is getting hot again. They they increased I mean from what they from what Jerome Powell said they they increased the rates so that they can slow down the economy. But if the payroll numbers come back hot, then that shows a labor force that's not slowing down. Um, so you, you can make a case that that they they did do it too early. Okay, but it remains to be seen with the economies, man. There's it's like gumbo. It's, there's so much like in that in in that soup. Um, any economist that's that's trying to tell you like in a black and white fashion that something is completely good or completely bad, it's trying to sell you something. Because there's no way that you would know. There's, yeah. there's just no way that you would know. And of course, the conspiracy theorists out there, they'll say they did what they did to help influence, you know, one person or other person in an election, right? Which of course, like... I don't, I don't rule think, that out. Yeah. I, I don't rule that out at all. I, um, it well, of gets, course, people on the left say they're like, you know, each side said the other side's doing it, right? Yeah. It, and that's the issue. Um, Jerome Powell was a, a President Trump pick uh, chairperson at, at the Fed. Um, now, since then, at least uh, from President Trump, I mean, he, he said things uh, that wasn't, uh, you know, congratulatory towards him. But it's important to note that, that, that Trump put him into, yeah. uh, into that position. Uh, at least he appointed him. And who knows? Who knows? There's so much, I mean, because then you have to speak to the politics of the Federal Reserve you have to know all the people that sit on the boards there and you just don't know where their, their politics are. No. Um, you can't, at least I can't say whether they're uh, all the way left leaning or right leaning or I, I just don't know. I don't know. I, I can't say. So does it really matter who's in power? Does it really matter the GOP is in power or the Democrats as far as like economy running the nation? Does that really matter? Or just a system just runs it? Um, no, nah, it, Kind of somewhere in the middle. I'm sorry. I don't want to just keep see my I'm obfuscating the question, but uh, it depends. It could definitely influence it. I mean, if you have uh, someone that comes into power that is incredibly um, anti free market, uh, let's say business in general, they want to uh, hike taxes to the moon, uh, put in a lot of regulation, you know, just th that kind of thing. I mean, that would definitely influence the economy, and especially the stock market. I mean, that'd be, that'd be the first, actually, you'll see the stock market first, because economies take a while to kind of play out. Um, but there is, I don't know, like the market is the market. You know, sometimes it does things that we just, it's just hard to explain. But to say that a president doesn't have like influence in the policy that they're trying to enact, doesn't have any kind of influence, that's, that's ridiculous. It definitely does. So, of course, everyone knows about the United States uh, stock market or Wall Street, right? But every country has their own version of Wall Street, don't they? Most countries. Okay. Yeah. And, like, how do, like, I'll make this up. Like, how does the, um, the quote unquote Wall Street in, like, say, Hungary affect the United States? Or is there more the United States affecting other countries' Wall Streets? It's, it's more the U.S. affecting other. Um, now, another big one is the London Stock Exchange. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. It, um, they would, so the, let's say like emerging markets, um, like third world countries, they affect uh, our stock market so much as our, so like you'll have hedge funds or mutual funds or whatever, some kind of fund, private equity fund, that will put money into emerging markets. Now it is, historically speaking, they don't put a lot of their book, like their balance sheet in, into these funds, but if they start increasing their investment into into those markets and things will go, then it could affect. If if the emerging market uh, fund doesn't do well, it can affect our, our stock market because some of our biggest companies will have some of their excess cash invested into the emerging market. Um, but it's these are offshoots. I mean, this isn't the this isn't the bulk of what happens. It's, it's normally the U.S. leading the way for for other for other countries. Okay. So obviously you have a lot of driver focus, right? But can someone have 
too much driver focus? Like, can you have so much driver focus that you kind of destroy the people around you? Yeah. If that makes any sense. Yeah. 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 I mean, that, yeah. Yeah. So, but now if you win, it, it, it papers over everything. Look at Kobe. You know, you, if he didn't win those championships, we will put him in that category yeah. as having too much. Um, and you can have it to a point where it literally kills you. I mean, I, I know a guy that's a, a hedge fund manager that, um, I mean, he puts my work ethic to shame. I, I mean, when, when I see him work, I, I just want to like grab an ice cream <laughs> and like just watch Breaking Bad because it's like I, I can't compete with that. Um, but he has literally worked himself to the point where he, I mean, he has two strokes. Um, I, be, I believe he just left the hospital because uh, it's, it's um, look, run a company. I mean, that's the big leagues. And I literally ran the Olympics. Run, run a, a real company is the big leagues. There's, um, I mean, you wake up, it's like you have um, Molotov cocktails thrown at you, you know, from, from all sides. There's uh, people threatening to quit. There's uh, partners trying to uh, cut you out of the deal. Uh, there's people, you know, like your main people that have something going on in their family. Uh, there, I've even experienced people like trying to start a coup like in the company. Um, and it's, it's nonstop and it's unforgiving and it doesn't care like what you have going on or how you feel about something. It's, 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 it's a serious game. And, um, you know, so whenever I, I see or hear a story about the hedge fund manager, I don't even judge it because I get it because sometimes you have to do that. You have to be in overdrive or look like you work too much to even maintain like the base level It's it's kind of like just what it is. I'm not saying you have to sign up for that to, to to run a company, but I mean, I see it far too often. I mean, some of those things I just said were things that I went through. And I feel like I'm just getting started. Um, it, it, it's not for everybody. And so what, when did you start your company? What, what uh, year? About 2018. 2018. Yeah. So we are right now. Are you like, of course, I think that's going to be you're not happy and not satisfied, but being realistic, if you go back to 2018, look where you're at right now, would you be like, okay, I, I'm doing some things or I'm disappointing yeah. myself? Or... No, 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 no. I, I mean, if I go back in time and, and I knew I would be right here in 2024, um, I, I, I'll probably start crying, to be honest with you, because it's, it's been an incredible, unusual uh, level of growth. Uh, for the company from from then until now. Now, because I'm the one living through it, I like a lot like when I was running track, you don't appreciate it as much because you're currently going through it. You're you're thinking of ways to improve and things that you need to be doing. Um but nah I you know I, I don't take it for granted though. I mean I, I I it's at the end of the day, I don't have to worry about immediate expenses. Um there's a base level of comfort and I'm able to take care of my family. So how do you do this? Right. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, they're so focused on now, right? Like this, they're, they're, my mind, they're struggling. I'm not doing nothing, but they just take a step back and look past six months. Oh, wow. I've actually done some things. I moved it. Like your quote is like moving inch by inch per day. Right. How do you mm -hmm. make sure you do that? I don't think I do that. Well, to be completely honest with you, um, I'm still incredibly impatient. I, I still want like a lot of things in a, an incredibly short period of time. Uh, I wouldn't be the guy to give advice on how to execute on that right now, at least. In a few years, we'll see. But I, I, I just, that, that's one of the things that I need to work on. Um, I'll have, I'll say like every month or so, there's like a small moment where I'll realize it, but then it, it'll quickly just dissipate. Uh, and it's back to being like stressed and kind of uh, agitated. Can you talk about that? Um, I, I think a lot of people, me included, I think you're, you're included too, like, we're, we're pretty self-confident. We know we're doing a good job, but there's like that, that insecurity too, right? Yeah. Like how do you balance that? It makes sure the insecurity doesn't, you know, take up too much of your time. Yeah. To be honest with you, I, I don't think for me, there's even a balance there because most of the time I feel like I'm not doing a good job. Uh, I, I almost exclusively think that there's too much that I could be doing better. Uh, I, I think I fall short on most things, to be quite honest with you. Now, if you ask anyone in the company, I, I don't know what they would say. Uh, I would assume they wouldn't agree with that, but that's how I feel. Um, 
but I don't I don't know if you'll ever not feel that way. At least for me. Yeah. I feel that way in track all the time. And are, are you still doing jujitsu? Yeah. Is that you do like every day? Talk about that some. Um is that like a hobby of yours? Like keep yeah. you... listen, I'm 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 not gonna compete. Um I'm I'm gonna be a hobbyist um for the rest of my life. Uh it's really fun. It uh is oddly really political too though, depending on where you go. There's uh but no, nah, it depends. There's caveats with that. If you're looking to increase your rank to like get a new belt uh and and, and do that thing uh as a hobbyist it is very political depending on where you go uh but for me i just i just enjoy it you just do like work out and meet people so to speak no <laughs> to be i mean you end up doing that yeah. but but that's not why i do it um i'm at capacity i mean i don't i don't i'm no longer at a point where i wake up and just want to just meet a lot of people i'm open to doing it but yeah. i just i don't leave the door to do that um i so you doing are you doing competitively any kind of way or you just go there to like you know I, get your workout in and leave i do it just to learn more about the art okay to be honest with you because it, it's um it's i don't know if you play dota or uh like counter-strike or something competitive like that there's the the surface level of it like learning the mechanics and there's like the deep 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 game of it and i just enjoy kind of getting deeper into into the art of of how to how to practice jujitsu because okay. it's it's a whole it's a whole other rabbit hole it's it's a thing in and of itself and i just enjoy learning i enjoy it the same way i like playing chess learn like like uh different openings like like through a low pass or, or like just whatever I, I i look at it the same way as playing chess just it's just like a physical very physical version of it and are you still like learn to play the piano i haven't started you haven't started yet no okay. uh, i still want to learn i'm okay. i'm most likely going to pick it up after the move. Okay. Because now I have a, just too much on my plate. And everybody, Martin, any new art pieces recently? No. 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 Um, there's a story. I'll tell you off here. But there's a story behind that, too. Um, but no. Okay. No, no, no. It was heavily involved in Museum of Glass, though. Okay. So, oh, yeah. Let's talk about that. That's one question coming up. How about being a board member of the Museum of Glass? So I stepped down recently. Oh, did you? Okay. Yeah. Um, I, so Museum of Glass, that's the one in Seattle or the one in Tacoma? Tacoma. Tacoma, okay. Yeah. Um, they're awesome. Uh, I'm going to start there. They're, they're awesome. They are, uh, what they are doing in Tacoma, uh, I, I hope to match um, one day in, uh, like, like, like at Texas. Uh, it's, it's a very important, uh, like, fixture in the city of Tacoma. Uh, everyone there is great. I literally just have too many obligations. Okay. That, that was it. And I, I had to step down because I didn't want to do them a disservice yeah. of being like the, the kind of frazzled. Yeah, and that's guy. good on you because too many people would have been like, okay, I, I know I can't give, give value to them, but I'll keep it on there just so I have another like pair of them I had, so to speak. Yeah. So that's good on you, I think. Yeah. And so too, too many I, I appreciate like that. that. Too many people like that, you know. Yeah, and, and, and I just had to be upfront and just honest with the boards. Like, I, look, uh, I have like, Personal things going on. I have a. Uh, I'm about to be a dad. Just got married. I uh, uh, and, and like the business. It's it's just I, it's, it's just, too much, right? Yeah, it's it, especially as we're expanding and approaching um, like new initiatives. That's going to require a lot of time. I just I just I just can't do it. Is your company is a? Are you already global? Or are you planning on going global with the business? Um, the plan, the plan is to be global. I mean, technically you can say that we're global now. It, it just kind of happened inadvertently, but we're going to be intentional about that over the next 10 years. Uh, right now, core business is, is just stateside. So I'm sure you have this plan somewhere. Like you have a plan, I can maybe go like Vietnam first, China first, Germany first. You have yeah. like that mapped up already? Yeah, it is okay. definitely London. But London so, first? So, so the, yeah. Okay. Yeah. UK. Okay. UK first. And it's because it's the financial hub. It's, I mean, if you're not in the U.S., uh, for finance, mm -hmm. you got to be in the UK. Okay. And so all of us only have a certain number of spins around the sun. How are you going to make sure you take advantage of everything you can and be the best version of yourself with your remaining spins around the sun? Um, I, I, I would say by just doing what, what I'm already doing. I mean, I still approach the day the same exact way. We're, we're just doing five, five things every day. Um, it has yielded great results for me. Um, Look, I have, a, I have a great life, man. I mean, I enjoy it. It's fun. It's uh, it's like being in a party that never ends. And um, 
you know, like, that's why I was telling you before um, we, we went on air that, you know, every time I see you, I feel like I, I lived a, a, a complete life since the last time that I saw you. And I always feel like I have a lot going on. And um, I just want to keep doing what, what I've been doing. I mean, I have a grown company, met my wife, I have a son on the way. Uh, we're preparing for a move. My family is doing well, by the way. Um, it's, I'm in a good swing of things. You know, whenever I see one of my friends, I, I tell them like, I feel like, I feel like it's weird to, for everything to more or less be doing well. Uh, Cause you almost feel like you should be preparing for something to happen and trying not to do that has proved to be difficult for me. Cause it's just, I don't know. It's just, it's just who I am. I'm, I'm kind of like just waiting for the pin to drop for something bad to happen around the corner. When was the last time you took a real vacation? Uh, I went on a vacation. Uh, it was like a three day vacation to Oregon. Uh, we, we was on the Oregon coast. Uh, okay. Took my wife. Um, that was what, like two months ago. Okay. But even then, I mean, it, I mean, out work. Yeah. You know, but, vacation. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, that, but that's what it is now though. It's like, you yeah. know, it, it kind of just blends in because I don't have to, it's not like a fixture where I have to be at a certain location all the time. So, you know, I move around a lot. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, you, you can argue that I'm always on vacation. Cause I'm taking calls like while I'm on, on a hike or yeah. just doing something. But um, the, the last intentional one was to Oregon, though. It was beautiful, too. Nice. Um, can you define, quote unquote, doing the work? What does doing the work mean to you? Do, like a hashtag? Like, yeah, yeah, just doing the work. I don't know, because I don't like it. Okay. I don't like when people, I don't like hustle culture. I, okay. I, I, I personally, you know what makes me mad is that <laughs> I'm put into the category because I get it. I, I do, um, I do speak along the lines of hustle culture, but I just think there's so many people in there just, just full of it. Like, I, I, I think the people who pound the table the loudest about, you know, being the face of hustle culture, I think they work the least. Because if you were really grinding like that, yeah, you, you wouldn't be talking about it. Yeah, you wouldn't be talking about it, and you wouldn't have the time. You think you are you? Do you think you're gonna see Jamie Dimon like doing stuff like that? No, he's he's too busy running. You know, the biggest bank in the world. You know, and the the real players that I have met are like that. They don't they don't need to profess it because their results are showing it. That and that's why I stopped doing as much talking like, um, in general. Like I'm just like well, one like there's a certain part of it where you have to talk it into existence. That's true. At least I believe it. Um, but then once it starts existing, you're busy living it. So like, you know, you don't have time. And then you get into lawsuits and like just crazy people. And I just, as of late, I just prefer to just to, to be more under the radar personally. Yeah. Um, like everything that it comes with, like being out open, it's, it's not, to me, it's just not worth it. I didn't like it in track either. I just never, my peers would do more of that. And I just didn't like it. Yeah, I think I remember hearing what Will Smith said one time that he had to allocate like four or $5 million a year just on lawyers to deal with people suing him for like crazy bullshit things. Yeah, uh, I, I didn't hear that from him, but I've heard similar things from, from people of that stature. And um, I, think, um, I think 50 Cent said he does like around $2 million a year for the past like 20 years. And um, I can tell you without getting too much in detail that I get it, I see it, I understand it. I mean, I can only imagine, but that's why I don't really do too much. Though. Yeah. I mean, outside of like the stuff that I normally do, I don't, um, like you're not gonna see me at a party or uh, I, I keep the networking events to a minimum only if I absolutely have to. I just, I'm just not into it. I, I prefer like doing my thing and it's been time with my family. Like the my favorite thing to do, like as I wind down at night, is play Town of Salem with my wife. Okay, like it's 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 the funnest thing in the world to do. Is uh, we, I don't know if you ever played Town of Salem, but it's um it's a mafia like game where everyone has a role. There's a town, there's a mafia, and there's like these neutral <laughs> roles, and you just act it out. Like it, I just it's fun. I like it, and it, I, I love I love seeing the smile on my wife's face like as we play it. Because it, it's, I mean, she genuinely enjoys it. So what, what's a skill you don't have that you want to learn? But when you do like the cost benefits analysis, you're like, man, I want to learn this, but I just can't, I don't have the time to do this right now. Maybe uh, later on, but this, I like can't do it Like a specific now. skill. Yeah. 
Um, uh, hmm, I'm struggling to think, and I, it probably comes off a way because it makes you think like I have all the skills of the world. I, um, I don't know. Here's why. I, I can give you like the intangible skills, but something tangible, I don't know because my job doesn't require it. Uh, it doesn't. It doesn't require it at all. Actually, it's it's kind of coming off. We can fix it real fast. So next one, how, how do you how do you provide value? There you go. Cool. All right. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, what was that? How do you provide value? Um. So one by identifying the problem. So that's, I, I think that's the hardest thing to, to actually do is identify the real problem. Not, and not the problem that, some, most of the times I would say, the problem is something that isn't um, openly said. You know, you, you, you have a meeting with your main people and you're, you're talking over whatever issue or whatever deal. And, you know, having the, uh, the wherewithal or in, in the field to understand what they're not saying and then to address it. To, to address what's inferred but not explicitly said, um, I, I, I think to go back to uh, the other question first, I, that's the biggest, I, I think, that value that, that I have to give, to be quite honest with you. Um, and then kind of find it. So my job is, is to be like a, a is, is, is to be the orchestrator. It's to kind of take this ensemble of like many parts and get it all going in one direction, establish a culture, Make sure everyone can take care of their family, um, but it's it's very much easier said than done, because I mean you're dealing with randomness, and you can't bottle something. I mean your job as CEO is to bottle randomness and to uh, kind of have it take the form that that you wanted to, and to move in a direction that everyone agrees with. Uh, and and I, I would say that my ability to do that is, is the biggest thing I, I have to offer to the company, because if not, I mean. Everyone there can, uh, I mean, they can sound off numbers faster to me. They could, uh, they could do probably most things, mo most things. Um, don't get me wrong. I mean, I can work a deal. I'm, I'm good at it. But the, I mean, they're better at doing that one thing specifically better than me. And my job is, is just to see the entire board and to make sure, well, one, also to make sure everyone's in the, in, the right, in the right position too. And then to get it all flowing in, in the right direction. So like, don't talk specifics, like generalities. Like, how does a company use yours to get money, right? Is it like they get, they get referred to you or like they have to do an application process? Like, how does all that work? Uh, like, how do we find out about? Yeah, like, what? like, pose like, you know, ABC Towing wants to do a $20 million debt equity to expand their franchise across the Southeast United States. Yeah. So, 70% um, of our book of business is through referrals. And then the other 30% is, is through, it's called the advertising means. Or, or means of advertising. Um, yeah, so for that, for that company uh, specifically, they probably wouldn't find out about us specifically um, unless it was from that 30%. Because um, then for them to find out about us, they would have to already know someone that knows someone. Okay. Um, yeah, so it, not that we wouldn't work with a company like that. It, we probably, uh, it probably wouldn't happen because they, they just wouldn't know about it because most of our, our business is through referrals. Um, and then, so, I mean, we'll have uh, a consultation call with them, to figure out who they are, uh, what they have done and what, what they're doing today. Um, discuss some options for them. Um, then they'll, uh, follow, a, a know your customer, uh, form. Um, and then we'll tell them what, what, what we think we'll be able to do. And then we we'll take it from there. It's, I mean, our, we, the biggest benefit I believe that we have over, a company that has been doing this for over a hundred years is that um, we have the ability to be more personal and kind of just relate to them more and, you know, have more of a human element. Because if you're a boutique or not even a boutique, but just a smaller company than the giants, uh, that's what you have to rely on because they, they can't do that because they have too much skill. They can try to do that. They can do it to a certain degree, but it's the one thing that you can go deeper on because you, you just have more, you have more space and opportunity to do it. So what's the time like when a company first comes to you is the time like 
get the money with the six months, three months, or is that obviously? I guess that depends each time, right? It does depend. Um, I would say on average, right now is about six months. Okay, which which is is taken longer over the past two years or so. Okay, and that's only because of markets. Uh, no one knows where interest rates uh, are going to go, uh, no matter how confident they they may they may uh, they may seem. Now we we have a strong opinion on it. A, a qualified opinion on it, but we don't know. Uh, and because of that, with the the capital sources, the investors that we work with, they if we don't know, they don't know. Yeah. Uh, and we kind of have to work on their timelines on that. Uh, but you know, a lot of times it's not even just because of the pricing of it. You know, if if you're looking for just pricing, like just the absolute cheapest rate, mm -hmm. um, we're 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 not the option for you. Okay. I mean, we we could do it, but we're not going to advertise ourselves as that. Um, we're not all the way there, but we're kind of a special situations group now. So you um, you can afford a more hefty interest rate. You just you need the terms of the financing to be more flexible, though. We're a flexible shop. So after the deals close, do you do anything else with them? Do you help like mentor them? Do you keep in touch with them? Like what do you provide after the deals close, so to speak? Yeah, well, we'll we'll keep in contact to see. Well, well let's make sure you don't. I mean, you spend that much time with someone, and you know everything. You build relationships and stuff. Yeah. So there's a human human element to it of just just checking in on on a peer at that point, uh, and then it's it's to see because you know most of these these loans are are not ten year loans. These aren't these aren't uh, like commercial mortgages. The, a lot of these are bridge loans uh, that need to be refinanced out uh, after a year, eighteen months or so. So um, it's just it's just just seeing that they're good, they're they're liquid. Uh, their capital stack is strong, um, and to make sure they don't have any drama going on. Because if so, that that's where the the president's club will, will kick in, and will provide the the support through the consultancy. So obviously, you want all, all all your clients to pay back their loans, right? But in in your business model, is there like a certain percentage that can go bad? And you're still good. Does that makes any sense. Um, like is that yeah. risk factor in there? Like, okay, we're gonna factor in twenty percent and won't pay it back because whatever. Yeah, well, we, because. You know, our, our core business is is to broker it. Um, so if if they don't pay back their loan, it doesn't damage our book. So like our our balance sheet per se, it damages our reputation though, because we, the firms that we partner with, to to fund the loans, they're they're relying on us to bring good credits to them. You know, uh, good deals. And if if we're um, presenting the deal as a surefire, more or less thing, and it it goes south, then they're not going to want to work with us. And, and we do bank for that, you know, but I mean, it's credit. So there's always going to be risk involved. And, and, and they understand that, they, our, our capital partners. They understand that. It's never a good situation, though. We have explaining to do. I mean, these, these are companies that can fund easily like a $50 million deal just like that. Uh, and so they understand there's going to be good and bad. Uh, they just want to, they want to weigh the risk out correctly. Um, but it's not a good situation for us to be in either, though, because again, we have, we have explained to do in that situation. So you have a, a, a certain people or organization you go to right now. Is a plan like expand that set of people you go to or organization you go to? Yeah. So you know, funny enough, we um, it used to be just to go sheer volume, but what we learned is that it's better to have a fewer number that we can just go deeper with because there's not but so many clients at, at any given time. Uh, and it's, I mean, look, there are places where they'll take it and just shop it to a thousand different places. We don't do that. So we, we have 30. Now we don't get me wrong. We have, we have hundreds, uh, but we have our top 30 that we, we see as true business partners that, that will tailor the deals that we bring to them mm -hmm. to. Um, yeah. And, and th those are the 30, I actually had a conversation with one this morning. Uh, th those, those are the core ones that what we're really focused on right now. The organization, do, what I, does one of them tend to only do like, you know, construction loans, one only tends to do real estate, one tends to only do like, you know, infrastructure? Yeah, but so that 30 that I just mentioned, that's, these are for everything not real estate related. Okay. Real estate is a crapshoot. I think you should go volume for real estate because just who's feeling good about that opportunity at that specifically, you know, given time. Uh, but for everything non real estate is what I was referring to. Okay. But yeah, but you're right though. I mean, it's you have to sift through a sea of because, you know, at, at the point of you enunciating that, 
you know, tomorrow they may have different parameters in which they're lending to. So you have to be on top of that. And um, it's just, it's a forever change in seat. Like at any given moment, their box could change of what they're actually lending to. So I know you, you'll do public uh, PR releases sometimes about different things you've done, like partnership with cities or can you talk about any, anything about that? Um, like any partners for cities or anything exciting coming up you can talk about? No, okay. at, at least not anything specific through the investment bank right now. Okay. Uh, I got in trouble last time. Okay. Well, I mean, like, you know, like, I don't want to say the name, but you received a partner for the city. Yeah, I, I, I know exactly what you're talking okay. about. Um, I can't speak to that. Okay. Uh, at, le at least not in any real detail. Okay. A anything I say will So how does that work? Like, is it the city reaches out to you and say, we need funding for this project or... Um, and it's, I guess the question is, is profit versus nonprofit a different aspect of the business? For us? Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. If um, Now, we're talking about um, a municipality. That's different. Um, we're putting out a different bucket than nonprofit. Um, but, n you know, funny enough, uh, a lot of times nonprofits, they are actually more, uh, I don't want to say careless, but just more loose with their finances. In my experience, from what I've seen, I'm, I don't want to speak for all, but be, from what I've seen, though, because they're not beholden to profit, it's just they're comfortable paying a higher fee. And I always, I thought that was interesting. Like it, it's, it's that is a, kind of strange because it's still a business. If you think about it, I mean, the check structures are different, but you still got to, you know. Yeah, yeah, I but I, I tell you what, to go back to everything we've been talking about with capitalism, when you're beholden to a profit, uh, to a profit margin, it makes you more disciplined. It, it makes you a lot more disciplined. And um, I, I, it may be as simple as that for the, the, the nonprofit part because they're, they're just not, they're not in it for profit per se. I mean, don't get me wrong. Someone's making money. Yeah. But uh, because on paper that in it for profit, it just is more, more loose with, with, with their budget sometimes. Yeah. So next question, like this is generalities, right? So this is like a big topic, big vision thing. Like, you know, almost conspiracy theories. Like, Mm -hmm. How do the so you know uh, what's in it, Marcus Aurelius, right? Yeah. How do you how did the Meditation. human race how do we go from Marcus Aurelius to Hitler, right? Like how did that happen? Like it seemed like we went backwards in time. Um, like, how did the human race do that? You know, you think you you like you feel we keep getting better morally, ethically, and of course you know it's a general question, you know. Yeah. Um, well, Marcus um, was a philosopher king. He, um, intellectual, all right. He, and I realize that styles in his years, all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand the question though, but, um, you can argue that most of what he has written, most of his work is academic. Okay. And as we know, there's a difference between, uh, doing something, you know, for academic pros and doing something that has the impact of people that like getting people to rally behind something. Um, when you put that, that people aspect into things, it completely there. I mean, you throw logic like out of the building. I mean, you go to a football game. You think people are acting logical there? Like, no, when you, when you, when you have large, uh, a large body of people, for any specific cause. I mean, it could be anything. Anything. Um, you're, you're going to see them take form in ways you didn't think was logical, per se. Um, you know, I'll be honest. You know, I used to, like, growing up, when we, when we learned about the Holocaust uh, and, like, all the horrors with it, I used to say, how in the world, like, could something like that happen? Clearly... That was the wrong idea. Like it, clearly, they were the bad guys. But um, to extract it from specifically the Holocaust to just like world events now, I can one hundred percent see why um, like a country can get behind something that centuries later would be looked at as the wrong side of history because they they think they're doing the right thing, and they look around, all they see are people who agree with them now. Even during that time period, because Germany isn't uh, absent of any great thinkers. So there are the people uh, who often decide that weren't publicized as much 
who have who have written great work and you know done the whole thing that said very uh intellectual things against it but they just weren't they they, they aren't part of the mass like that's that's not what people care about in a situation like that if if, if you're emotionally involved you're not th you're not thinking like you're really not thinking you're just going off how you feel yeah i don't think people realize how close all of us are to be the most evil version of ourselves right we're not that far away i mean just you know you get unemployed or you know you know, like those electromagnetic pulse comes, you know? Yeah. Like, we're not that far away from being like... Yeah, because even during then, the um, the, the Holocaust, or, or events leading up to it, they were experiencing hyperinflation. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, we, we, haven't, we haven't seen hyperinflation here, um, at, le at least not recently. But we have experienced inflation. We've seen things that could be uh, um, looked at uh, synonymously with, like, bread lines. Mm -hmm. And you know, just the the smell of it, people, you, know, you kind of felt kind of felt uneasy. And um, trust me, when, when things get real, again, logic plays no role. You, you're you're thinking, how can I make it until tomorrow? How can I take care of my family? Like crazy. Like I think last week they they, they were having this dock, dock worker strike, right? And I know down where I live at Dupont, the Casa there, they they had a run of the toilet paper, right? I'm thinking, man. Y'all doing around toilet paper for the dark work strike. What we all do if like shit really hits the fan, right? Yeah, yeah. And that's a really good example. So, Cause uh I know remember during COVID mm -hmm. they did the same thing. Yeah, toilet paper of all things. It was it was the first thing to go. Yeah. Uh, it um yeah, I mean also th this is why I have um I still have my opinions, but um I I'm definitely still critical, but I'm more understanding of like the um like the little the little kid in the hood that's like that, that turns to being a deviant, uh, seemingly out of nowhere. Uh, now, if you 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 empathize with that kid, you know he doesn't have any options, uh, and because he ha doesn't have any options, he needs he needs to feed himself right now, and he's not looking tomorrow or nothing like that. Doesn't care about it. it means nothing. Like I'm hungry right now. Tomorrow means absolutely nothing to him. That's like speaking a pig Latin. Doesn't understand it. Doesn't even care to not applicable he's, he's hungry you look like food he wants to eat right now um and so i mean if you look at it that way in a lot of ways i i understand it uh now the intellectuals can debate about how that kid got to that point what happened to his parents are there any parents the system you know you, you can take it in a lot of different directions but i i i get why people act off impulse like at any given time, especially if you feel like you don't have any any options or any backup plan. Yeah. So back to Marcus Aurelius, right? So if I have my history right, he was like the last of five great emperors of Pax Romano kind of stuff. He did a lot of great things for his people, whatever. But then he picked his son Commandus to be a his replacement and Commandus, like one of the like the one of the worst emperors. Like how why do you I mean, how do you think Scott and Marcus Aurelius made all these great decisions? And couldn't see that his son was gonna be such a horrible emperor. Uh, well, first I want to say I'm, I'm not totally uh, adept to like that that complete history, but on the surface, <clears throat> look, you ever heard the the um, the joke like if you're so smart, why aren't you rich? Mm -hmm. You know, it's um, look, it's it's a different thing to to kind of throw throw uh, theories out in an academic setting. And to do, and and then to make the right decision when you know everything matters, uh, it's just it's just a different beast. Um, also, I think retroactively for its work, we we um, we pick out the best parts yeah. and highlight that, yeah. and we just throw away the things that, yeah. that that just wouldn't hit the same. Um, and it's family. I mean, yeah. we all are blinded by, by by the family aspect. I mean, That's true. You you see the best in, in people that you love. Yeah. Um, and again, I, and I don't judge it. I, I understand it. Uh, you just don't want that to happen with the entire, <laughs> you know, nation behind you. Yeah. So next, let's talk about uh, about one of your heroes, Alexander the Great. Oh yeah. Yeah. So with him, um, people don't realize this. I learned this from listening to your podcast. Like he, like he, like he, he, like he lived like beer bread. Like he didn't really eat nothing like that. You know. Yeah. He was a drunk. Yeah. Alexander the Great was a, he was a drunk, and and people don't know he was homosexual. Mm -hmm. he, 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 <laughs> Alexander the Great was a drunk homosexual. Oh wow! 
and and you know what? He was more gangster than than all the the big brawling mm -hmm. like warriors. Not he. He had size to him, yeah. But he was more. I mean, look at him. If you looked at him today, he'll be looked at as frail. Kind yeah. Of. So would you like become like a, like a? I want to say Alexander the Great uh, Amar, but what what drew like that one specific like historical figure? What 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 do I think of him? I mean, what, what drew do do do? Oh, what drew me to him? Yeah. Um, his sheer. I mean, at number one, absolutely is his fearlessness. Um, he just wasn't scared. Uh, like to uh. uh it was he was insane. I mean, he just he didn't register like fear the same way that the normal person person would. Um, and a lot like Napoleon, he was a strategic genius. I mean, he wasn't like a brute. I mean, there were times where he would brute force yeah. uh, like certain battles, but he wasn't just like a dumb brute, uh, like charge at you like kind of general. That he was very strategic. He, um, he he was very intelligent. He was a he was a, a well put together person. Like he was um, he was athletically fit, and he uh, was. I mean, he had he grew up under philosophers. I mean, he this was we're talking about a very well rounded person. Yeah, I mean, his father Philip did a lot for him too, right? I think you yeah. know he had a good father figure. Yeah, yeah. Um, oh, you you do know about Alexander? <laughs> <laughs> not not as much as you, I'm sure. Um, but yeah, yeah, he, so, you know, that's interesting because he grew up, he, he grew up with a dad that was the man, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I wanted to what degree that played a role, like how much of that was nature versus nurture. Yeah. And it's like Marcus Aurelius, people don't know this, but like, I can't remember the, the emperor before Marcus Aurelius, but, um, so for some reason he saw some Marcus Aurelius, so I won't make this, I'm going to adopt this guy, make him my grandson. But until then, I'm going to name this other guy the emperor, right? Thinking this other guy's going to die like in four years, he's like in the 70s. Mm -hmm. Well, the semi-old dude actually lived for 20 more years. <laughs> and so from the time I think Marcus was like 12 to 32, he's like, he was like, un like an understudy for this emperor, right? So he had like a pretty much a 20 year internship how to be emperor, right? Mm. So I think that's the, that probably played a role in like how, how great people think he was as emperor. Mm. Versus a lot of bad emperors in Rome was like, you know, like they became emperor at 13 years old with all this power, like that, that shit crazy. Yeah, yeah. I, um. Back back um, to Alexander. He um, so one was his fearlessness, and then I, I want to uh, re-highlight like just how well rounded he was, because um, you know that's part of the reason why I retired from track. Because uh, I mean, I did it. You know, I kind of, you know, I can kind of see the ceiling. You don't want to be like a one trick pony, so to speak. Correct. And um, you know, when, when I looked around or would talk to my peers, or at least they saw themselves as my peers, um, I didn't get the depth that you know I was quite looking for. Um, I didn't quite feel comfortable like just being bunched up like intellectually um, with with like that crowd and I just just felt like this doesn't get me closer to uh, the person that I want to be like you know when, when it's all said and done so I just felt like my time was up it's time to pursue other things um, and I, I would say it was a lot to do with, with Alexander because I mean the guy was well rounded he, he, he just was he he was just he was intelligent. He was fit, and you know he, he was intelligent in an academic way, and in a practical way. He could he could apply it into the world, and because you know you can you can you can be a great poet. It doesn't mean you know how to game up someone. It doesn't mean you have charisma. Mm -hmm. You know, it just means that you can write well. And he knew how to do both, and it, that's incredible. It's something like that small. It's just it's just incredible. Another person. Like that, I would say it's fifty cent. Huh. Um, I'm very passionate about this. I don't know why, but I feel like uh, fifty cent does not get the credit that, I don't think so that, that he deserves. Um, people don't even know how big of a of an artist that he was and still is. Like, um, I think he has the third, not the third, definitely top five highest selling album of all time. Uh, and his international presence, you can argue, is bigger than it is stateside. Um, only for him to to take that and to leverage it to you could argue again be even better in business. Um, I mean, listen, there's enough rappers, there's enough rappers to go around, especially the low quality ones. Um, there's a lot of, of, of businessmen, and he did both, and he's continuing to. It's, it's not like the story is is written and like it's ended. He he's 
still actively doing stuff. So I actually know someone who worked for him at G Unit Records. She did she like finance for him. Uh -huh. And she's like, like she like he's the best person ever. But she is like, he is so driven and focused, right? That's like like he walked in a room, you just knew who he, like everyone else knew when he walked in the room, he was the best person there. Like he was gonna like dominate in all aspects of business, rap, whatever it was, mm -hmm. he was gonna win. Yeah, and and it's um it's impressive. Now, I, I, at night on not playing time with Salem, uh, I love to um like just watch one of his interviews. You just it, I, I think he makes the, the interviewer jobs easy. Oh, yeah, he does. I think uh, so, too. You just have to sit down, just ask a starting question, and just let him go. He starts freestyling. He's freestyling. He's in the interviews freestyling. I mean, that's what he's doing. He's letting his thoughts just flow. So one thing I admire about him, that's probably not the best thing I admire about him, but I admire his level of pettiness, right? <laughs> like, I, I, I aspire to be his, as petty. So, like, that time, like, Jarvis had a concert. He bought out Jarvis' concert so no one would be there, you know. Yeah. I think he's about to release a, a Netflix documentary on, on, on P. Diddy yeah. titled Diddy Do It, you know. <laughs> like, you don't want him, that guy to be your enemy, right? Yeah, because, yeah, he'll, uh, he'll wear you down. He's going to go all in. Like, uh, he's still fucking beef with Jarvis after all these years. There's Rick Ross. There's, yeah. Um, yeah, there, there's, but you know what, though? No one person he doesn't beef with uh, is, is Eminem. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's yeah, nothing but hard things about him. Yep, Eminem, uh, and Dr. Dre. Yeah, yeah. I, I've never heard him say anything no. bad about him. So, you probably know this like, like a few years ago when Dr. Dre and his people did the halftime concert at the Super Bowl. Remember that faintly? Yeah. I, don't, I don't watch in a okay. So, at the Super Bowl, there's this big time halftime performance. So, it's Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Eminem. Oh, yes, yeah, I know where you're going. And so, Eminem told JC, I'm not doing this unless my guy's there. If 50 Cent's not there, I'm not there, right? Yeah. So you get him. So that's why, you know, 50 Cent, like, you know, like, that's my guy, right? Because he goes to bat with him, right? And yeah. I think we all need someone on our corner like that, right? Someone who's going to go back for you no matter what. Yeah. 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 Eminem, um, by the way, real quick about that. I don't, I don't know if you, so like the, from what I understand, the person that, that, uh, that, that 50 Cent gets compared to is Jay-Z. And, um, you know, They've had like back and forth um, over the years. Part of it is just rap, you know. Um, and the other part, I think it's just, um, just being competitive. Yeah. You know, seeing, I mean, people don't, don't I think, fraudulently so, don't, don't look at 50 Cent in that same category as Jay-Z. But you should, um, if not higher in that ranking, if, if we are ranking. Now, I'm not saying you have to, but, you know, we're humans, so you just naturally do it. You know, who, who, who's number one type of thing? Um, I I think a, a longer conversation should be had about that. Uh, it's actually a third person too. Uh, I wasn't planning on going here, but I, I don't know why I'm passionate about this. Um, it's it's Birdman from, well, Ca from Cash Money. Okay. Yeah, I mean, as far as like his production level or like just a business aspect, business uh, purely business aspect. Because okay. I don't know any of these people. I can't speak to how they are with their families if they're Christian. I I don't know. Uh, purely business. Um, cash Money is the highest selling uh sub label yeah under a and major the they pushed out like of course the the original group and little wayne yeah he don't drake got started there yep Nicki minaj got started there yeah you know and it's um now i get if you i mean you you google Berman or you watch an interview he has a very thick accent uh he has the tattoos he presents himself as a blood that you know all of that and i get it Appearances matter. You're gonna turn certain people off just off that. I, I understand. I'm not. I'm not sitting here saying that he should or should not. You know, I, he's a man. I, I don't care. He's been himself. Um, but purely from the business aspect, it, I mean, they have the number one hip hop label. Yeah, it's far none. It's it's not even debatable. Um, if Cash Money was a public company, it'd be in the Russell 2000. That's crazy. Yeah. But be, because of how he talks and like the whole mm -hmm. package. It just, it doesn't get mentioned. Uh, I, I just, I think that's absurd. Another press I don't think it's credit is Master P, right? Yeah, of uh, course. Yeah. Of course, all of them. I mean, uh, all of them. Mas I believe the story is Master P was the first one uh, to get a distribution deal with an 85, 15, 15 Yeah, that sounds split. right, yeah. Uh, I forgot the label that they did it with, but um, yeah, I mean, these are real historical entrepreneurs. Uh, that's why I care. Yeah. And it, the way, like you said, it, like uh, 50 Cent talks about 
Eminem, Snoop Dogg talks the same way about Master P. Mm. Master P really yes. took care of him, like yeah, like he like really set him up and stuff. I don't know the story. Like Snoop Dogg told a story where Master P said, "Do a verse, how much money you want?" Yeah, and Snoop was like, "Man, I have no money. I heard five thousand, and like Master P gave him like, dude." Here's one hundred fifty thousand dollars. You know. Speaking of Master P, uh, he was the first person to take Fifty Cent on tour. You know the story behind that, right? Yeah. Well, at least I think I do. But go ahead. Uh, so where, where I remember hearing the story is like they're going on tour before Fifty Cent hit it big, and Master P paid, paid him his money. Right? Hey, you know, Fifty, I had some things come up. We're going to later tour for like six months. You already have your money, whatever. Yeah. Of course, then that shit blew up, and Fifty Cent like, damn. Yeah. You know? Yeah. 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 That was that was um that was a a good a good bet yeah on Master P on uh, yep. Fifty Cent yeah but you know, I, I um I love all these entrepreneurs they uh you know they are the the shining example of everything like my whole philosophy I mean they 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 have done it and they are doing it and uh it, it's it's impressive I I I watched them take bits and pieces. And find a way to, um, you know, enact it to everything that that I'm trying to do. So for you personally, either when you're dealing with a person or a company, what's your red, what what's some red flags for you? Um, man, red flags. It, you know what's, what's funny about red flags, you, Jason? It would shock you to the degree to which I just go and feel. Uh, like I don't I don't have a long list of things, you know, in general, good or bad. I can just tell, like, when I see it or when I feel it. But if someone is, um, if if they're, like, three minutes late to a meeting, uh, what I read that as is you, you're, you're testing, first, first of all, you're trying to make me wait on you. So, like, you're, you're trying to see how much you can kind of control the dynamic. I, I see that's petty. Like, you, you care more about playing, like, games like that than, like, actually doing the thing that we're there to meet about. Um, and then if something really small, like they, if they just say they're going to do something but don't actually follow up on it. And I know we all make mistakes. I mean, I've done it. You know, so I'm not, I'm not overly critical about it. But if I feel like, if it reads to me that it's a pattern that you just do, then I, I'm, I'm not working with you at all. Like, yeah. at all. I'm gonna say where it's time like we're wrong, people would be late all the time sometimes, but like if you're 20, 50 minutes late every meeting, to me that's a signal that you're not, you know, respecting my time. You think it's more important than me, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, it definitely reads that way. Once in a while, yeah, but every single time, no. Yeah. Yeah. And and they're not considerate of your time. They 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 think that you know 15 minutes for both of y'all are valued the same. Yeah. It's just not. It's no. like it's it's just not. It, I don't feel bad saying it. It's just it's just not. So you talk about some earlier, but talk about the role of empathy in what you do. The, the role of what? Em empathy, being empathetic. Oh, empathetic. Oh, I mean, you know, I learned this. I, I still struggle with it. Let me start there. I, I still struggle with it. Um, but I think it's one of those things that come to people as they get older. Because if you're, in, in my opinion, if you're, if you're young and saying that you're Mr. or Mrs. Empathetic, you know, you kind of just talking because you don't have the life experience to really empathize with someone. You may be sympathizing with them, but you, how do you know? How do you know what they're going? Through? You don't. You don't feel it the same. And what I found is, as I got older, I started empathizing with people more because, you know, people uh, they just trying their best. You know? Like they, they just trying their best. And everyone's not you. They're not going to look at things the same way that you do. They're not going to go at the same pace, whether it's fast or slow, as you. And I hate saying this because I feel soft even saying it, but you really do sometimes got to meet people where they're at. Um, and it's okay if y'all don't have a working relationship. Like, I don't, I think that comes along with being empathetic, that you can, you could be empathetic towards someone and understand that it's just not going to be a good fit for y'all to work together. Because um, I, I used to be Mr., you know, just chase down every opportunity. And I just don't do it anymore. You can't make, just like what I was saying about, about my son, like you can't make someone do something they don't want to do. I learned that the hard way, like the hardest way. You can't make someone do something they don't want to do. Uh, and I, I, I think it's all like related to, to empathizing. Um, I, I think if you're truly empathizing, you, it leads you to that result 
of like just trying. If if it doesn't work, see where they're coming from, and it's like, okay, it's cool. You know what? Let's just let's just not do it. Because in business, like every little JV that you do or or whatever, it's it's like a mini marriage. So you gotta be in it for the long haul. And I'd rather just recognize it's not gonna work than get really involved and it kind of spin out later down the road. And like you get emotionally involved, you start looking at the margins. There's a uh, a time investment into it and. I'd rather just cut it off. So how do you know when it's time to cut it off? Um, I think most people wait too long to cut it off, right? I, I do that a lot. Um, but I take on fewer opportunities now uh, for that very reason. Because it's hard. For me, it's hard to go back on a commitment. So I'll, uh, I really just vet it out for a long time. Some, sometimes some, like something that I would do is just uh, put up um, almost like blockades to to draw out the process to, to, to put like basically put time in it so that to see if they're like serious about doing what they want to do. Cause if not, then you just jump on a lot of things that, cause people just be talking, like people just say, yeah, you know, they want to yeah. do this, that, you know, and there's no follow up. No. And, um, so what I'll, what I'll do is just, you know, okay, well, uh, send this to me in like a month or so, or, you know, some, something to that effect. And then if you don't if you don't hear from them, then it goes back to being empathetic. Yeah. It's like, okay, well, I'm not mad at you. You know, it's it's just what it is. It's just what it is. So you have a lot going on. Off your time's valuable. How do you make sure like people don't waste your time? You know, I've I've gotten a lot better with it now. Um, by the way, I hate saying that I have a lot going on. Even even though it's true, I I can feel myself being that guy. Yeah. Um, but um you, now I'll wait for things to kind of filter through the company. Uh, so, I mean, this is, there's things in track that I'm actively pursuing, reaching out, setting up meetings for. So there's that. But outside of that, because with that, I have to, I have to entertain uh, potential opportunities that have a low likelihood of playing out. Uh, uh, I need to kind of still figure things out as, as we go in that direction. But with, with our core company, um, it's, I wait for things to filter through. I, I make it, I've, I've made it incredibly hard to get in contact with me if you don't already have my, my, my number or my email. And, um, you know, because I've, I've had, I mean, Jason, you'd be surprised. There, there, I mean, recently too, there have been people who have politic through the company uh, to set up a meeting with me. Uh, only for them to try to work some kind of play, or it, like there's like some kind of angle to it. Mm-hmm. Um, so what I've done is made it even more difficult for things to even like get to me. Mm-hmm. There's there's many layers uh, in the company before it, it gets directly to me. So that way, I, it, it'll just get filtered out, and that's been the best thing that 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 has worked for me. Okay. So hypothetical situation, and I'm not smart enough to answer this question. Okay. Let's suppose. You know, um, it was out, the arm, Alexander Great and his army at their at their at their prime versus Genghis Khan, his army's at their prime. Who do you think is going to win? Um, and the battle could be anywhere you want it to be. I was, I, I mean, it has to be Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. Yeah, because um, they, I mean, Alexander, uh, I mean, he went in 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 that direction, uh, and retreated. Um, Genghis Khan, from what I understand, was uh, I mean, he really was a savage. Yeah, he was like, yeah. I mean, he's top three, top three, if not like a, a automatic bid for one. Um, I don't, I don't think Alexander. Did. No, no, it was that was, I mean, because it was at that point of the let's call it the march, um, that. I think he realized he was going too far. I mean, he had, he had to go eastward. Mm-hmm. Um, and set up Alexandria, actually. Uh, as we went through Egypt, you know, it, it went that way. Actually, from what I understand, it was short. It wasn't that long after that where he actually died. Okay. Because um, he, he he went up. Um, forgot forgot the name. Was, was it Mongolia? I think so. Yeah. Um, and then um, retreated, and then went back east. Um, yeah, and, and it was because after he went through Egypt, that's when he supposedly uh, got poisoned. 
Okay. Um, yeah. So I, Alexander didn't win. No. Nah. Okay. Nah. Um. So how did how did this happen? Right. Like I hear the, like what's a phrase or um. There's two brothers. The dad's alcoholic. One, oh, yeah. one says I'm an alcoholic because my dad's alcoholic. Other one says I'm not because my dad was one. Like, yeah. how, how, you were thinking like boy, being raised in the same house, both people turn out the same, but so many people like turn out differently, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's just because like internally mechanisms people have or different signals they take from people. Um, yes, to the latter. I mean, people just perceive things differently. Um, I think I mean, one's like being defeated, so to speak. You know, I have no choice in my fate. It's already been predetermined. Yeah, and you know what? I think it, it speaks to people's temperament. Um, and that's also why, to bring it back earlier, I don't think you can really change people. Uh, not to say that people cannot change. I, I just don't think you're the one to do it. That's for them and God to figure out. Um, you know, to that point, though, you know, I, I experienced that in my own household um, before my dad got clean because he was, he was an alcoholic at the time. And um, actually, I had this, my dad sent me that quote because um, uh, I'll have a drink once, maybe twice a year, but I'm, I'm, I just, it's not my thing. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't, never drunk beer. I, I just, it just doesn't appeal to me. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, that, that quote hits even, you know, more home for me because I just, it's just not my thing. It, it's, it's just not my thing. And, uh, I think my dad appreciates that too, to be honest. Um, not, not to even say that he'll be overly critical either way, but I think he's, he has seen my reaction to it and looked at that entire evolution as a good thing, as a positive. Because I, I can tell you one thing, I've been doing a lot of things in my life, good and bad. I'm not, I'm, I'm not gonna be out of all. Yeah. Because it, it's just not. Yeah. But yeah, people's temperament dictate how they respond to things differently. Um, I mean, to, to bring it to a more poignant example, you can be in a in an econ class and you can walk away a capitalist or a socialist. You know, the same thing. Good point, yeah. It's, it's the exact same thing. I mean, people have a, a certain temp temperament to succeed and other people don't. They have a temperament to uh, point the finger and, and blame the world. I, I think it's loser shit. I, I can't get with it. I just don't like conceding defeat. In general, um, and it's it's sad. It's it's sad, but it is what it is. I, I don't. Again, I don't try to change anybody. That's it. You discussed the last time. I'm kind of paraphrasing. So, like from my point of view, twenty percent of the world is trying to do better things, trying to add value, trying to be the best they can. Eighty percent is like doing crap right. Mm -hmm. You still agree with that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, one hundred percent. Um, it may be fewer percentage trying to do good. Yeah, maybe closer like five percent. Yeah. Which is which is scary. But I don't think that's a stretch though. I mean, look at the employee to owner ratio. Yeah. It's probably actually it's less than five percent. It's um not not to say that if you, you don't own something, you're not doing good in the world, but I think you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Um yeah. And by the way, I don't even say that as a negative thing. I I'm not I'm not saying that like like we're screwed. You know, like like let's run for the hills. It um, it's probably always been like that since the beginning of time, probably right. I would imagine so. Yeah, yeah. And most people just want to get along, just go about their life, work the nine to five, go watch some TV, have a good dinner. You yeah, know? yeah. And um, I just could never live like that. I I just can't do it. Uh, that's a that's a prison for me. You can't put you you can't put a free spirited person mm -hmm. into a situation like that. Yeah. It's just never going to work. Uh, I knew that about myself very early. Early? Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. Can you talk some about your Christian faith? Because you're, you're a big Christian person, right? Yeah. Can you talk some about that, how that affects your day-to-day -day life, the business, personal, all that kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, everything. I mean, it's all in me. And were you always like a, a I don't have to use the word diehard, but you always like a diehard Christian since an early age, or that, that happened later on in your life? It, it happened later on in my life. It um actually happened. It was actually very very recent. I would say it was uh like twenty around twenty eighteen. Well, I, well, I you know looking back, I've always walked with God, but I've been more intentional about um about trying to 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 make decisions that will put God uh in the best light possible. 
and to put myself in, in my view in the best light possible to God. Um, but to be honest with you, um, outside of of taking time to like reflect and actually reading scripture, uh, and like seeing how it it has and can apply to my life, that's been the biggest um, the the biggest yielding thing that that I have done specifically to anything you know de dealing with my faith. You know, it it amazes me just how um, insightful the the Bible really is. Um, it's I want to say weird, but yeah, you know, it's there's nothing weird about it. It's 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 the source text. I mean, that's we believe it starts there. You know, so of, of course it shows up in it, in any and everything. It's what any and everything is. Um, but it's incredible, man. You know, for me, when I had like moments where like I I felt God with me, it's it's been the most incredible. Uh, moments in my life and and when I say moments I mean I wasn't like on top of a hill like reading or anything like that I mean these were like quiet very quiet no music playing no tv just quiet moments like at home like just reflecting like just in deep reflection and uh like reading scripture and, be, and being able to feel God with me it's it's like those those many moments like that where at least for me I would feel uh, the presence of God, like in that moment, and um, it's incredible. Like it, it, it's truly incredible. Um, so now you know, I used to I used to speed through the Bible. I used to try to treat it like, like other texts. You know, it, it wasn't until I slowed down with it where it actually um, started shining its way. Like it it really started connecting with me. Uh, not to not to compare it to the Bible, but another book like that is art of war mm -hmm. uh i think i'm of the opinion now like the best text that you've read before you should read it as you get older because you just you, you pull different things from it and um you know that's something else that you have to read slow you have, you have to read very slowly you, you should probably take the course of a year at least for the art of war to read it in in, in its full you know in, in its entirety because um there's things that go over your head especially in younger years because there's no way that you can you, you can you can fully grasp it. So the Bible, do you like believe it's actually the word of God or do you believe like the, the God inspired like humans to write it or does humans just wrote it off out of nowhere? Uh, it, it depends on what books that we're talking about in the Bible. Uh, but for the most part, I do believe it's the word of God. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I mean, well, it there are parts that, well, that, that's an exact quote. Like, this is the word of God. Um, but I mean, if you if you read through different books, it is there. It is there, like, it, it is them telling the story of of what happened. That's not people don't realize the Bible is actually a collection of stories, right? Yeah, people yeah. don't realize people think the Bible is just one big book. No, it's like collections of lots of stories. Right, right. Um, incredible stories too. Um, you know, the first the first book in the Bible that I read when I was intentional about actually reading the Bible because that wasn't until around 2018, where I was like, you know what, I, I want to read the Bible, not just say excerpts, you know, here and there, yeah. um, was was Matthew. Okay. And that, that's all it took. Like, I, I read that and I was like, this is really interesting. Like, like really, really interesting. Um, right now, I'm, I'm going back through Proverbs, um, just reading it by the page. You know, my mother-in-law, uh, well, my, let me say my in-laws, uh, both, Mother and father in law, they um they gifted us Bibles mm -hmm. as a wedding gift. Okay, and um so uh, I read it together with my wife. It, it's awesome too. So make this total up. Like suppose someone came to you and said, "Hey Byron, I realize you believe in God, but can you prove to me God exists?" Would you be like, "Would you try to prove that God exists?" Or you'd be more like, "It's not my it's not my place to prove to you God exists. That's between you and God." Um, I would I. Well, one, I have to see how serious they are. You know, people just talking. Um, I would, if if they were serious, I would I would sit them down and oh, okay, not like in the moment, but we'll we'll, we'll sit down at some point and I'll go through verses with them, um, to see if it hit to them because uh, I do believe you know the number one thing a Christian should do is preach the gospel at least at least attempt to. Now, I wouldn't try to make them, because again, I don't, I don't believe in making people do anything. Um, so 
because I wouldn't try to make them understand it for actually for them to receive it. But I'll do my part, uh, 100%. I, 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 I would do my part. But I think that the, the biggest thing that you can do to, to show God's uh, existence is just by telling your fellow person that you love them. And really, that's just it. Because most people don't, don't get told that they are loved. Like it's, it's very simple and probably weird thing when you think about it, but people don't. They, they, don't, they don't hear it. Yeah. Definitely not on a daily basis. So what makes someone a good Christian, so to speak? Quote, unquote, good Christian. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 I can tell you, I mean, just because you read the Bible doesn't make you a good Christian. Yeah. Or yeah. go to church. Yeah, kind of definitely stuff. not. Definitely not. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, that's something that's in your heart. And unless you're in the court of law, I don't think you can speak to what's in someone's heart. Yeah. No. You, you just don't know. Um, you just, yeah, you, you just don't know. I mean, you just don't know. I, I don't know what makes someone a good Christian. Yeah. I, I, I can, I only have ideas on what I'm trying to do to be a better one, but I, I, I don't know. Okay. And like, I'm not expecting you to answer this question, but like, if there's one true God, like, how can there be like Christians, Muslims, Hindus? Like, why did God let all these religions come out, right? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, um, and what, you know, if you're like born, you know, in East Texas, you'd probably be a Christian. If you're born in like, some small village in India probably Hindu, right? So like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's something yeah. I always like struggle with, right? You know, like how can this be? You know, yeah, it, it definitely takes on um, uh, geographical mm -hmm. like roots, yeah, depending on what part of the world that you're in. Uh, the likelihood, if you're religious, to believe a certain religion yeah. or another. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've I've heard I've heard the theories that. Uh, Religions were uh, essentially drug induced. Yeah, I've heard that before too. Yeah, yeah. take on different kind of perceptions yeah. and then pass down through word of mouth. Yeah. Depending on you know, they take different directions that way. I've heard that. Um, I, I see. I see how people got there. Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer to your question. Yeah. To be honest with you, it, it, and even for like the few ideas I have, I'm not going to say because yeah. I don't want to start a religious. Yeah. It, it's I. I just don't want that. <laughs> Yeah, no, I got. I love that. my um my like my brothers and sisters uh across different religions. Yeah, I mean some of my best friends are Muslim. It's just uh, crazy how Jewish. many how many wars and people died over religion, right? The Crusade, all that stuff it's in the an, back, you know. Like, yeah. yeah, it's it's sad. It's it's sad. Uh, yeah, it's sad, especially now. You know, one of my mentors is planning on going to Israel. Uh, at, I think pretty soon, actually, like next sixty days, and um. I get it, but maybe not right now. For me, <laughs> no. There's too much stuff going on there right now. It, it's uh, I mean, bro, it's literally a hot war. Yeah, uh, they're fighting like, like a three front war. Yeah, the Hamas on the south, Hezbollah, Hezbollah on the north, and the Houthis from Yemen. Yeah, well, as a as a serviceman, what, what do you think of that? It's a complicated situation, of course. You know, the fear is like you don't want to ride a war. But well, the right of war is already there, right? I mean, you got Iran openly firing missiles on Israel. Yeah. We're openly knocking the missiles out, you know? So you, you kind of think we're kind of already in a proxy war with Iran already, right? You know? Yeah. It's, yeah. And it's always been like that, right? Yeah. Even back in the army, there's always right. stuff going on there. Like the PLO, all this, you know, it's just, yeah. If, if, uh, would you be comfortable being deployed over there right now? I mean, I, I would be, yeah. I mean, I would be uh, just because I've done it before. I, I have the background and stuff, you know. Would I want to go? Obviously not, right? But yeah, it's it's just a tinderbox over there, right? It's always has been like I remember back in '83, um, they blew up the U.S. Marine Hotel in Beirut. You know, mm. it's always been stuff like that over there, right? And it's always been like Israel fight all these wars, like the nineteen six seven six day wars, all this kind of stuff. And then one thing that gets me too, I same with top top, but kind of same. Like you have all these people in the United States protesting, right? And of course, you can't believe it watch the news, but you never hear anything on like, you know, people in like um, Jordan or Syria or Middle East countries like protesting free Palestine, right? You never hear that, right? Yeah. The other, all the rich people in like Saudi Arabia, they never, hey, here's $100 billion, come move here, right? Yeah. But, you know, it's just a complicated situation. It's yeah. like, it's, it's, they're, all, they're still in the eye to eye, eye for the eye thing over there, you know? Yeah. yeah. And one thing I get to like back in October 7th, when the Hamas, like, Flew over when their glider jets, all that that concert that killed all these people, right? Like we all, everyone forgot about that, right? 
It's all this free Palestine stuff. Not everyone. Yeah. Not, not everyone. It's complicated, though. And then, like, you know, so Israel does one thing, Iran does something back. Israel, everyone ups the ante, right? No one's going to say, like, the prime minister for Israel, now you're thinking his name, like, how would he look? Like, we'll go back to October 7th, right? That happened. The smart thing would have been to not do anything, right? That stuff happened, like, but they attacked pretty much immediately, right? The smart thing would be, like, kind of, that attack immediately, like, you know, like, you know, do some stuff right. Mm -hmm. Of course, they attack immediately, and then someone else attacks immediately, right? It's just like the escalating version of war, and was it in, right? Yeah. And, and then, like, people realize this, like, so when Iran fires this out, out, out of Israel, it has to go over Jordan. Last two times, Jordan's knocked down half of them, right? But you think, back in the day, the Arab country would never do that to another Arab country. But now, Jordan's closer to Israel than they are to Iran, right? But people see Iran as, like, the menace. It's, and this is, like, this is like the Iran versus Saudi Arabia proxy war in Yemen, you know? It's, like, mm. like... Everyone's fighting everybody, right? It's just, yeah. But I definitely want to go. I want to go visit there anytime soon. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you. When, when he told me that, I was like, God bless. Uh, and I hope you make it back. Yeah, it's just too much going on there. I mean, you might have a missile strike any day. You might be in Tel Aviv having a pina colada on the beach. And then boom, boom, boom. And it's like the October 7th, them, them Israel people were, you know, like some kind of wave, what, EDM concert, having a good time. I always look up. And you see like these people were like, Machine guns, right? I've seen that. I've seen a video of that, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's, I don't know. I don't think that would be fixed, right? I mean, here's one for you. So, after World War II, all the bad things happened to Jewish people, right? This is my opinion, right? So, the British said, hey, we're going to put you back in Pal uh, like the Holy Land, right? This place of Palestinians. I think what they should have done was, okay, Germany does all horrible shit to you. As a, a way to, to make it right, we're going to give you Barbaria. I think they should give the Jewish people Barbaria in Germany, a way for Germany to pay back all the horrors they did to them, instead of like moving them all to the Holy Land. Hmm. I mean, it probably wouldn't have worked at all, but. I, I, I get the thinking of that. But then you just place the Barbarian people in. Yeah. You, you have the same problem. Yeah. You, you have the same problem. But at least for the, in Germany, you can say, hey, German people, you know, you do horrible things. This is how you, you know, make up for it, you know. We're in, we're, we're, what if, is your policy, you want to call that land, there you just displace the whole people. Even though if there, Israel was there first, you know, but I watched this one show where this Palestine, like, um, he asked this Israel guy, where's your dad buried at? He's like, Germany, grandfather, Germany, you know, my last eight generations have been buried in this town. So how is this your land and not mine, you know? Mm. I'm, man, you think that would give them rights to the land? I mean, the Palestine guy, it, it was yes. Because my people have been here eight generations. How many generations were all buried here? You're trying to come back after being gone, you know? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's tough. Yeah. And like, you know, all the, all the charters, all these terrorist organizations, Hamas, Hezbollah, is all in the charters, like to wipe Israel off the face of the earth, right? It's like written in there, right? Yeah. And so how can you, like, how can you, like, Israel, leader Israel, how can you, like, how, do you, how can you reconcile with that? Yeah, yeah. Like, how can you do a deal with someone yeah. who in the charter says to destroy you, right? Because, you know. It's like Iran for us. Yeah, if right? you do a deal with them, you know they're going to go back on it, you know? Yeah. I, I don't know. Do they feel the same way about Israel? I think so, yeah. I'm sure, sure they do, yeah. Mm. And Israel, Iran, I mean, I remember, like, a long time ago. Israel did a stealth bomb strike and like destroyed their nuclear facility they were building. You know, like they've always been go back and forth. The only reason Iran been actually attacking Israel, it always been like through proxies, right? Through Hamas, Hezbollah, you know, giving them funds and stuff. You know, but I don't know. That's tough. You just got to pray for everyone. Yeah, got to pray for everyone. It makes you more. Uh, this for me it makes me more uh, appreciative. Oh yeah. You know, it, it, it makes the the capitalism and socialism arguments futile. Yeah, it does. And plus, like being in the United States, you know, we're relatively safe. Of course, not one happen, you know, that's like a, you know, whatever it was. But rather, you, you realize, odds are you're going to wake, wake up in the morning, you know, see that cell's not going to be destroyed by, you know, a missile attack, right? For yeah. the most part, right? Yeah. Yeah. So you feel like, or even like you're in Israel, you don't know. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, it's it's funny. People don't really think like 
how good we got it because mm-hmm. uh, north of us is Canada, and south of us is Mexico, yeah. and we're not. There aren't tense relations there. No, there there isn't the worry of like you said is waking up. No like, missiles just. Fly There's not going to be a ten thousand division of Canadian people on the border tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, and um, you know, more importantly, how how would you act if that was the case? Like, yeah. what is what is what is po- the policy you support? Then look like yeah, uh, people don't consider it. I, I'm gonna bet if like we, there was like extra like um, armies on our borders or wanted to like, evade us, I bet everyone would be pro gun then. <laughs> For sure, everyone would be pro gun then. Yeah, that was one of the first things that um, uh, who's Russia at war with or Ukraine? When uh, Zelensky? Yeah, when when uh, when the war had first started, I, I believe one of the first things that happened was that he legalized. Uh, their ability to to own firearms yeah. is it, it, it's not it wasn't funny but it was like it was interesting. One thing that was funny right that happened you had a bunch of liberals saying hey let's send our guns to Ukraine they need them like what how does that make sense you're anti gun but now you want to send guns over there yeah yeah that's um it's it's very hypocritical it's 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 very hypocritical. You know what I found though with either side, like it, it for me, it it doesn't even make sense a lot of times to even like point out flaws in no, argument. It doesn't. It doesn't. At this point, it's a it's a cult. I mean, They're so like ingrained in their belief. Yeah, it, it's their religion. Nothing you do is gonna change it. Yeah, exactly. Like so, just people, you know, who think Trump is the worst thing ever, you're not gonna change their mind. Yeah. Other people who think you know Vice President Kamala Harris is the worst person either, you know, like. I don't believe Colin Miller is a communist. I don't believe that, you know. Mm-hmm. It's like, I don't believe Trump's going to, like, you know, destroy the country, you know. But some people believe that. Well, he didn't. Yeah. He's already in office. <laughs> yeah. And think about, yeah, you know, like people, like, he's going to come destroy the whole country. He become a dictator. But he left the last time. Yeah. I can just stay last time, you know. But yeah. Everyone has their beliefs, you know, what do you want to call it, you know. It's their religion. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. It's their religion. And, and there's no, there's no, uh, like, reasoning with it uh and for some reason people don't and i have no issue doing this like just saying like hey i'm not qualified like i don't, I don't know yeah like, it's it's okay not to know it doesn't make you weak mm-hmm. or make you look soft just not know something i think that comes from school culture though where you were cool or like elevated like your your status was elevated yeah by by knowing more stuff yeah and the issue i think a lot of a lot of people are having when they leave school they don't um you know, the real world doesn't operate on that kind of no. time. They don't give a fuck about what you know. No, they don't. It's, it's who you know and what can you do. And a lot of people, when they graduate, have a hard time coming to terms with that. Like, well, well my, my degree is this. All right. You know, you, um, you, need, you need to learn how to politic now. You need to learn how to grease the wheels and how to appeal to people. And you just don't learn that in school. Like you don't you don't learn that at all, actually. No. Like it it leaves you in that like in, in that regard. Yeah, I definitely think school's gonna change big time in the next 10, 20 years. First of all, like is education even, even worth it now with all YouTube diversity, all these free courses to learn, you know, chat TBT, you know, all this kind of stuff, right? Yeah. I just Yeah, I, I, I saw the um the the Twitter uh post, the uh, X post that um that kind of went viral. When a teacher was saying like her job now um with, with her papers it's a, a college professor too was saying her, her job now with her papers is just to check for plagiarism mm-hmm. and is, is no longer like to really uh you know judge or grade the depth mm-hmm. or the understanding of the topic um i don't feel sorry for that though um you created a system where you're you're incentivizing people to do whatever it is to get a good grade. Uh, and, and also your papers are, they are distributed in a fashion in which, you know, I mean, the topic that you want them to write to can just be bullshit. I mean, if, if you just have to say, because I had this, I had this issue when I was in school. I, I would get a paper like in a government or history class um, and I would give my honest opinion on it. But because it wasn't, in lockstep with what the the bulk of what the class agreed with or saw to be politically correct, I would get penalized for it. 
And, and I, I remember being an office officer and talking to the professor and saying, hey, look, if you just want me to say things to agree with you, then just say it. Like, why, why are we even playing this game? Why, why, why even do it? Um, so I, I, don't, I don't feel sorry for if If you are doing something that can just be replicated, which because chat GPT doesn't have depth. You can tell when something's written by chat GPT. It doesn't like, it doesn't say, it doesn't say much. Like you, you don't walk away with a feeling that it, it just has the surface level. Like it has like glossy words. It has nice prose, but like. Yeah, throw some, throw some fluffy words in there and stuff, you know. Yeah. But, um, so they shouldn't be giving them prompts, giving the students like topics to write on that can just be bullshit like that. Um, but then you have to really start taking a look at like everything. And I don't think we're there yet. It, right now, we're in the complaining phase. We're and not at the point. They'll rather like find ways to check for plagiarism than change the way that they're asking their questions. Yeah. Which tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. <laughs> so do you have any vices that you want to get rid of? Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, 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 we all do. Um, uh, I have a very addictive personality, like just in general. I don't... Um, I don't just like things like I love it until like I can't stand it anymore, um, which is good and bad. Uh, I think the good parts are obvious, but like, bad it's really bad. Like I, uh, I love to eat cookie dough. Mm-hmm. I love cookie dough. I love the the sugar, uh-huh. the, the Pillsbury uh, sugar cookie okay. dough. Uh, I I eat a whole I can eat a whole yeah. pack in once and I just knock it out. Uh, but I, I've always had a sweet tooth though. I, I've I've always. Like my cheat days, when I was competing, still, I'll just go hard. Uh, I I would go hard. Like I was catching up on on two weeks worth of like sugar. Um, yeah, dietarily, that that's my number one okay. price though. Sugar, Def, definitely sugar. So for a company, like, of course, you won't be the biggest company ever, but like, do you have like goals? I'm like, in, like, like grow by twenty percent this year, twenty five percent next year, or expand different markets. Yeah, you know, um, over the next three years, I want to keep growing by hundred percent. Um, yeah, for, for the next three years. Um, you know, I'm no longer, um, I'm comfortable with, at least off headcount, not being the biggest company in the world. Uh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that. Um, I don't mind off, again, off headcount being more middle market um, and just having a good, a good market share because there's ways that we can leverage that outside of just riding the finance. We could be receiving the finance. Is there such thing as, can, can growth be a bad thing? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of startups, as we both know, that focus on driving revenue at all costs and just uh, widen their losses. They're out of business if, unless they can just keep raising money, which is most of startup culture is like just raising money yeah. to raise more money to raise more money down the road. And each step of the way, they're losing more money. So they're just evaporating their shareholder equity. Um, yeah. I, yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, there's a natural, you know, if you raise too much money out the gate, that's what happens yeah. a lot of times. I'm not going to say all the times, but a lot of times. Um, there's a nuance. It's the same way why, like, the athlete with the multi-million dollar contract go broke. If you don't learn the process of how to make money over, like, a, a good time period, then um, you don't know how to keep it. And, you know, the same thing that affects the athlete affects the, the startup, uh-huh. the founder. They they raised over ten million dollars, but they didn't earn ten million dollars. Yeah, they they put together a presentation. They were charismatic, and now they got a check, and they don't know what to do with it. And they and they go from grinding in the garage to like we can afford you know a ten thousand dollar a month you know yeah penthouse for office you know yeah and then uh, free lattes for everyone like you know these things these they things add up. add up oh yeah they 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 really do add up and um if you didn't really bootstrap it with with no outside money. Then you, you just don't know what that that feels like. You, you don't know the like the pace of how a company mm-hmm. should really be growing. It's not natural to raise a lot of money without like a real a real concept or yeah. a real business. A it's, financial plan, like all that kind of stuff, like yeah. faction, your business model, all the real yeah. quote unquote business stuff, so to speak. Even in that scenario, they think they can just um, off offshoot it by like bringing on the same amount of money they raised by just bringing on a CFO, mm-hmm. but they don't know how to check. How to, how to check? They don't know how to manage a, C, yeah. a CFO. But it's, I mean, 
all the CFO did was come in and just siphon more money out. Yeah. In a in a legal and way. And do a fancier spreadsheet or yeah. do some kind of pattern analysis or something or Yeah. So it's like you you're getting hit. You're, you're just making life more difficult for you because you did, you weren't willing to do the, the hard part, which is to grow a business. So you might not be able to answer this question, but can you talk about how you do due do, do diligence on companies that apply to get funding from y'all? Yeah, um, you're right. I, I, I can't answer it in full detail, okay. but it's it's um it just follows a, a usual KYC process. Okay. Um, and like just a, a few conversations and they have to verify it with, with documents. Okay. Bank statements or whatever the case may be. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, it's, you know, just, it's not hard. Okay. It, it's, I know we, we've seen frauds. Don't get me wrong. Quite a few. Yeah. Um, but it's because of the process that we use that it, it'll normally come out. It's, I mean, you can't fake the funk for so long. Yeah. Like it's sooner or later, something's going to come out. Yeah. And um, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's the usual process though. Okay. Um, are you still involved with that startup? Like, were you on like a board of our startup or something? Are you still involved with them? They, yes. They did some rockets or something? In a very limited capacity. Okay. A very, very, very limited capacity. Okay. Um, they're doing well, though. Okay. They're, they're doing well. You met, um, I don't say his name, but you, you, you met someone else that, that was on the board. Okay. Uh, you may not remember it. It was, okay. it was over a year ago. Definitely over a year. Okay. Here in okay. Seattle, too. Okay. Um, but yeah. But yeah. In, in, in a limited capacity. Is, this is going to show my ignorance. Is there a difference between someone's personal credit and their like business credit? Yeah. Yeah. Do they affect each other in any kind of way? Is like one's like totally, di or totally separate? They're different. Um, the only way that I can think of right now that um, your personal credit can affect your business credit is that your personal credit can affect the first credit line you get. Okay. That would then be, go off your business credit. Um, but they they are different though. Okay, they they are different. Um, I think for obvious reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, our in our line of work, like personal credit mm -hmm. doesn't it, it has come up just to check, but like it's not it's not like it's not the reason why something is or not going to be um, executed on. Okay, for us at least. Does this play a role when you decide to do this with someone? Like, does there like how to put this like? You're about to close a deal with someone, and if something bad happens, like something comes out in the news, like this person is a horrible person, right? Does that change your mind, or like is it like if it was if it was very dire? Okay. Then yeah. Okay. Uh, because we there, there's stuff that happens mm -hmm. still to this day. Um, we're big boys. I mean, it's it's so long as it's not too you know okay. off the rails. Yeah. Um, then we'll 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 look past it. It's not personal. Okay. I don't take a lot of things personally. Is there an industry that you have not done? You have not done a deal with yet that you wanted to deal with in this like any type of industry they haven't dealt with yet. Yeah, um, it's uh, uh, medicine. Medicine, okay. Yeah, yeah, in, definitely interested in it. Not the startup, so okay, not the startup. Um, they're like, <clears throat> they're like, I don't want to say lottery, but they're. Um, they're like the music business. They're they're in the, the business of making hits. So you're either gonna do really well or you're gonna flop. And it's it's really that black and white. It's it's either all or nothing yeah. in, in that industry. And uh we're seeing more more money flood into the space. Okay. It's one it's one of the biggest industries. Yeah. Um it's top five. Is there a state like you find it's easy to do business? Versus, and some states are harder to do business in based on either economic climate, politics, or yeah, yeah. Well, I'll start with one that we don't. That's California. Okay, it's um, they have like a law for everything. Uh, everything is regulated. Like personally, I don't see how anyone hires someone from California. It's just so prohibitive. I did yeah. that one time. It's like, man, it's yeah, I'll never do it again. Yeah, there, there's, I agree. Um, there's that, and um, from I mean, from what I've seen. It's harder to hire the hire people there because they have a different like ethos. Yeah, they do. Uh, a lot like out here too, actually. Um, they just don't. I don't want to like to say they don't want to work, like or 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 to say they don't work hard. But we haven't seen that pattern mm -hmm. out of California. Yeah, it's just not really, and not and to be honest, to be frank, I'm not willing to do the work to find out. Yeah, just, I'm the same way. I did it one time. I'll never do it again. Yeah, it's, it's, 
I, I'm cool with accepting that sample size and just making a decision not to to uh, put more resources there. Uh, on the flip side, though, most most of our company, the uh, the people in our company are in Texas yeah. and Florida, and uh, it just worked out that way naturally. Mm -hmm. And we have some up north and in, in New York, but majority, and by majority, I say sixty percent is Texas and Florida. Is there a deal that would be too big for you? Like, suppose the company came to you and said, hey, we want you to do this $500 billion deal. Is yeah, that a deal that'd, like that's too big for you? That would be, be too big. That would be too so big. So what's your limit? Uh, About a billion. Billion, okay. Yeah. Uh, Even then, it's still difficult, but it it can be done. Okay. Um, $500 billion, nah. You, you would need uh, you would need a bigger, okay. a, a, a bigger company for that. Um, yeah. Yeah. Because... I don't think people realize how big yeah. five hundred billion. Yeah, that's it's a half lot. of a trillion. I mean, that's that's crazy. It's yeah, yeah. Um. So why 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 Austin? So you think about moving to Austin, Texas, right? Yeah. Why that specific city versus Dallas, San Antonio, Houston? Yeah, well, I gotta be around the energy of the football team. Yeah, that's true. Okay, so there, there's that. You know, it's a Texas thing. Um, I understand the area. Um, there's okay, so there's there's it really comes down uh, a lot of parts to a coin flip because for everything I say, you can make the same case for Dallas. Uh, I'm not well. Houston's off the table. Yeah, it's not going. Okay. Um, yeah, just Houston's is not happening. Texas specifically, it comes down to. Uh, being within closer proximity to um, one to the to the track team, mm -hmm. AUT, and uh, being closer to kind of where things are happening, specifically to track outside of UT, but professionally, because uh, we're going to start investing in, into the sport in a big way, mm -hmm. and um, you know because of Texas relays and, and a few other needs uh, in the area uh, for track, all things in Texas pass through Austin. So it, it just makes more sense to be to be closer to that, okay. and and then and then we have relationships too that, um, for that, that that we're gonna we're gonna leverage to to bring into the into the sport, and um, I'm really excited about it. I'm I'm happy to be back in the warm weather, uh, year round. Yeah. So I think maybe a year ago, Jay Z got some bad publicity because supposedly like one of his relatives, like a cousin, hey Jay Z, can you loan me hundred thousand dollars for a business? And Jay Z's like, no, I'm not giving you shit, right? Have you had to deal with that in your own like family where people are like, hey, Byron, are you doing great? Give me like loan me twenty thousand dollars for a business. Yeah. Had to deal with that kind of stuff. And how do you do how do you deal with that? Um, I say no. Okay. I I don't I don't it's not a thing for me. It's not like a big I just say no. Okay. Uh and if this didn't happen, but if it comes back like, oh come on, man, you know, you you got it or you know, you think you're better or I just I wouldn't care. Yeah. Those things don't affect me. Okay. I just don't care. Okay. I just don't care. I, I don't know the Jay-Z story, but I, I think I can understand it. Yeah. yeah. Um, When you get on, everyone suddenly know you or a family member. Yeah. And I mean, that's a real thing. People come out of the woodwork. And uh, yeah, I, I've experienced it already. Not, yeah, not I can just, imagine. Not specifically like just with, yeah. with family, but just people in general. Yeah. And um, yeah. So I, I was lucky to have the experience and learn how to deal with that. Mm -hmm. Um, people just switch up overnight, you know, pretending that y'all have a relationship that you really don't. Yeah. Or to manipulate a past relationship to make it seem like. Remember back in the day we like drunk cooks in the corner or some, you know, yeah. like we did this and that, you know. And what's interesting about that is is say that as if um, that's you know. You 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 drink and coke together in the corner, uh, led to you know X Y Z happening. Yeah, like there's a direct, direct, direct correlation. Yeah, like like they actually have anything to do with it. Yeah, and um, it's interesting. You know, you know, people uh, when they see you as a a high utility person, how they act around you, because um, you know if they if they know you got it, then suddenly they think uh they deserve, and they'll come up with any reason to to justify that. Uh, and then if you don't do it, saying that you change, not realizing that it's, they're the ones that change around you. You're actually more or less the same person. Yeah, it's the, they're the ones who change. You're right, yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, there's always a chance. I'm, I'm, I believe that big time. Yeah, it, it really teaches you a lot about people. It teaches you so much about people. Um, yeah, but at this point, I kind of expect it, so I, I don't. I don't even get blown away by it. Yeah. Just oh, this has happened again. Let me just. Let me just you know go back to to how I know how to handle this and just move on. I, I don't lose sleep. Yeah, I, I really don't. It's like your time's limited. You recently left the the, the museum of glass. Are there any causes out there right now that you're like really passionate about or actually like putting your time and money in to help out? Yeah. Uh, are we expanding it to, to business or? Yeah. Have you want to answer it? Yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, so of course there's an investment bank, um, but right now it's, it's track and field. Mm -hmm. It's definitely track and field. Um, I think there's an opportunity. Um, I mean, there are, there are new leagues coming up and there are existing leagues that are, are trying to expand now. Because there's there's growing competition, and um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to to help the athletes monetize their their brand and, and their career, and um, you know, uh, with with our background uh, with the investment bank, uh, we can leverage that to to help help the athletes do that. Um, so so that that's what I'm looking towards doing now for sure. And so you mainly be focused on college athletes. Any plans, like maybe go down to high school, even junior high level? Perhaps. Um, I want to create opportunities for them to uh, compete in front of a lot of people okay. so that they can ex expose themselves uh, and get rid of any kind of roadblocks for that high school athlete to, to get access to good competition. That's outside of just their state meet. So I remember like back in the day when Snoop Dogg had a Snoop Dogg football league, like this Pop Warner team league? Yeah, had. I do remember Do, do you see you doing, do you yourself doing something like that? No. Nah. Okay. No, no, no. The, so what I'm thinking right now, the core product would would serve for professional purposes. Okay. Uh, with the opportunity of, it, of that specifically being opened up to the higher end collegiates and perhaps maybe some some high schoolers that are really standouts. Okay. Um, but no, nah, no, nah, I don't. Um, you know, I I do some like pro bono mm -hmm. like uh coaching. Yeah. For, for some uh high school track okay. athletes already. Okay. Uh, it's fun. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it. Uh. But I have the flexibility. I don't. Yeah. It's not. It's not a full time commitment. Mm -hmm. It's not even a part time commitment. I just, if if I'm free that day, then I'll come out. Okay. That, it's that type of thing. Um, but Jason, it it would blow you away how wide open the, the market and opportunity it is right now for track and field athletes. It uh, it's not like football, or or basketball. Here's one for you. Um, so that I can't remember his name. That 16 year old kid who ran the 400 meters in the Olympics that made the Olympic team. Yeah, Quincy. Like he's in high school now. What would you? How would you mentor him? Like I wouldn't. That, no? I, I wouldn't because I, I didn't. I didn't run that fast at sixteen. Okay, I mean, I ran fast, but not. But that I saw like the business part, right? Like how do you like mentor him? Like, hey, this is your business side. You need to do this, do that. Yeah. You know, to be honest, I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even. I wouldn't even attempt to. Okay. There's there's so many people probably trying to do that right yeah. now. Yeah. Um, and most of the things he's probably probably not going to listen to. Mm -hmm. He's probably just going to have to learn it on his own. Um, and there's no reason. To say what to, to assume that he's not he he doesn't know more than the average sixteen year old or that he has people in his corner that yeah. know what they're doing because um, I, I just don't want to be the older guy that's like just you know like on the mic just you know just just lodging opinions his way okay um, it, I I think we should just wait and see because Tom will, will tell you everything but how insane was that that he made the team that's like pretty rare right yeah absolutely rare it's never been done uh, to my knowledge. Um, no, he he's he's a once in a lifetime talent. It's I can't stress to you how irregular like that is. Yeah, are you racing like people in their twenties, almost thirty years old, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I ran with Vernon. Vernon, I think he's thirty one because he went to LSU, and um, it was it was I'm not gonna say funny. It was great seeing them both on the same relay team. Um, funny enough though, not to take you away from the kid. I think it's more impressive that Vernon is running that fast yeah, at yeah, 31. Yeah. And Vernon, Vernon is one of the greatest 400 meter runners ever. He is definitely one of the most consistent, if not the most consistent. Uh, the guy knows how to run 44 seconds. I mean, he's like an automatic 44 whenever you step on the track. On his worst days, 45 flat. That's impressive to do, especially over 30 years old. It's, it's impressive. So, track at least, they'll have, like, they have like track seasons, right? Yeah. It was like, is a track season like a, 
like during springtime, summer season? Like, how's that work? And then how many like track meets are you supposed to run? Yeah. At, at what level are we talking? Like the highest level. Um, like Gabby Thomas, those kind of people. So then they're, um, at the highest end, you're probably not going to run indoor. And if you do, it's going to be like one off races. Okay. Assuming you don't try to run indoor championships. Um, you want to start um, in March. Um, you're going to build slow until USA's. That's, um, and by build slow, I mean, you're probably going to touch Texas relays. Mm -hmm. um, probably uh, meet in Claremont, perhaps Saint, um, Mount Sac in California. Um, you're gonna do you're gonna do like races like that, and then you're probably gonna do like one serious race in a diamond league. Uh, Let's so probably go overseas, um, and then you're gonna run USA's. Okay, because uh, because the goal is to make the team. That that's that's your top priority, um, as a as a as a professional athlete is to make your team. There's three spots per event. Um, it's outside of relays, say top six, but uh. You know, as a as a track and field athlete, if you don't make your team, you're not really okay. you're not gonna get a shoe deal. You can still make money at, at meets, make it up, but it's harder to get into meets at that point too. Is there like a senior circuit for track athletes? Like you're like track a masters? Athlete? Yeah. Circuit? Yeah. I'm not sure. I mean there there are there are open like master meets. Okay. But like is there like a diamond league for for seniors? Not yeah. to my knowledge. Okay. There's not a market. No, no one's gonna come watch it. Okay. Um, people, people are going to watch the pros. Yeah. Yeah. And do athletes, they get paid by the number of races they win or? You know, it's, it's different. It, it, it depends on their contract. Okay. Um, a lot of contracts, you do have a race minimum, a uh, number of races you have to, you have to race yeah. in. Um, and then depending on, again, your contract, you can get time bonuses. If you run a certain time, they bonus you out, roll over to your base. Um, and then also for making teams and for meddling, like all of that. These are like sales contracts. Where you know you get bonuses okay. for like incremental things uh, that can that can roll over into your base, um, so then you go into the next year with a, with a higher base amount that you you start with the year prior. So I'm sure like as like Gabby Thomas and that lady who like breaks all the 400 meter hurdle records, I'm sure that they're, like, they're one status. What is what is life like for like we'll say quote unquote average track athlete, right? Uh, as far as their pay, yeah, paid, you, you know, lifestyle it, that kind of would, stuff. It would shock you how opaque the market is for that 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 tier athlete because i was i was like in between um and it depends because if you assuming because it, it depends on your event uh and it also depends on the budget of the shoe company for that year they allocate a certain amount of money for each event uh, i do know that uh the contracts are are in four-year cycles but they'll give you three years in a one-year optional year um uh, that's pretty that's pretty standard, but like there's there's examples of that not being the case. Um, but for that tier, you know, this is why I'm coming back into the sport from the business side, by the way. It's it's to cater to that to that tier that that we're talking about that's not quite, you know, tier one. Uh they're not quite like tier three. They're like somewhere at two. Like they're fast, they're definitely world class. They're gonna have a harder time getting into meets than the tier one athletes, but they can still place at meets. They and they can make a team. Um they may not be an automatic lock to do it, but they can do it. And and what we're trying to do is is, is create opportunities for that tier to to earn a good living. Because right now, you know, it's hard. Because everyone because we're in the era of the super track and the super spike. So everyone's running faster and there's better coaching across the board. Um so you know, if you are a ten flat runner, or even say even nine nine nine, you probably you probably still won't get a. Especially if you're Amer if you're American, you're not getting a contract. Right. Um, whereas twenty years before, you had a deal, right right out of college, like, you, you had a good deal too. But that's just not the case anymore. So now we're trying to create um, opportunities by way of meets for for that that class of athletes to have a consistent schedule. Don't have to travel too far and can make money, make make a good living, not just money. But just make a good living uh, every year. Do you see yourself ever like starting your own like track league? Um, perhaps or or financing. Um, yeah, I mean either either or, either or. Okay, it's um, the opportunity to do it is there. I, I can tell you that right now. 
So I remember seeing somewhere where, like, I'm trying to mix up where, like, it said if you're a high school football player, you have, like, a 5% chance to go to college, to play football on a college school scholarship. And then from there, I, I'm thinking about, I think, let's say there's $10 million, 10 million high school football players, or, like, 2,500 go to college to mm -hmm. play football, or, like, 300 go, like, play the NFL. Uh, the numbers are pretty much like, kind of the same in track. Going from like high school track to college track to like I think, pros. I think proportionally it's the same. It's probably okay. fewer because I think there's fewer. I think I don't know. Well, the numbers are kind it, of the I same. Think it may not. No, I, I think it, it may actually be more track athletes because it's men and women. Um, yeah, because it's men and women. Yeah. Um, but proportionally, I think it's more or less the same. Okay. It's that's a uh, statistical, incredibly unlikelihood. You I mean, a lot of things have lined up correctly for you, right? You got some luck. You got to have good coaches. There's a lot of things to line up, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, absolutely. of course, you got to have. I was thinking about the luck part, but yeah. yeah, you do. You do need things to go in your favor. Yeah, for sure. You need, you need to have. Also, you got to have. You got to be naturally fast. You know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then you, you have to go to the right school, be with the right coach, have the right environment, not get hurt. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. You need a lot of things to go right. It's. It's kind of crazy when you think about it. Mm -hmm. It's so unlikely. It's, uh, yeah. You know, you don't think about it, too, when you're one of those people because mm -hmm. you're just comparing yourself. You don't look at it as, like, millions of people. Yeah. You're looking at it like there's 15 people yeah. I should be thinking about. Um, but and it's, it's best. I think it's best you look at it that way because if not, you're just going to get intimidated by the sheer volume of people that, that, can, uh, that can take you out, which is... Um, which is why it's, it's ever so uh, so impressive to to medal or even be at the Olympics. Yeah, it's uh, it's like the most difficult thing to do in all sports. Yeah, like you're like you're so driven. This was one of every four years, right? It's kind of insane. Yeah, yeah, it, it's um, it's a level of competition people cannot really um, they can't empathize with it. Like they just can't. They, they don't know what that's like. The to do that sheer amount of work and then for it to come down to a matter of inches. It's, mm -hmm. it's um, the precision and uh, consistency over years. It's, it's insane. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, have you been to, I mean, have you been to any Olympics since 2016 as a spectator? No, I will be at the next one in LA though. Okay. I, I'd, I'd definitely be in LA. That one, yeah. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I'm, I'm guaranteed I'm, I'm going to be in LA. I'm looking forward to it. it. That that should be fun. That that should be it'd be really good for the sport too. Yeah, the last one there was I think 1984. Last Olympics they had there, I think. In, in LA. Yeah, I think it was 84. Okay. I, um, that was, obviously I wasn't around yeah. for it, but um, but not nah, LA, uh, 2028. Mm -hmm. It's it should be fireworks there. Yeah. Yeah. So you think you go to a spectator? You think you might go there some kind of a um. As part of the UT track team, some kind of way. Oh no, no, I'm, I'm not. No, nah, it, it'll be as a spectator. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, um, nah, um, I don't want to be that guy. Okay. So, like we, I was looking at the the end of that Miami game, um, the football game. Oh yeah, man, that was fucking crazy. And um, yeah, it was crazy. And I was uh, Michael Irvin yeah. was on the side. Yeah. I don't want to be that. Okay. Like I, I don't want to, I don't okay. want to do that at all. <laughs> you don't be that guy. No, nah, I, I, um, you know, who doesn't respect Michael Irvin, but yeah. like, you know, I yeah, just, Michael Irvin is different than that guy. He's, he's the you through and through. It, don't get me wrong, I, I, I love I, Texas hat. Right, I, I love my Longhorn mm -hmm. more than anything. Yeah. But I don't want to be at one of their events mm -hmm. and like doing theatrics to take yeah. away from the focus of yeah. of the field of play. I, I just that's just not me. That's not me. Uh, I think it's kind of corny. Yeah, that's true. Um, so anything else that I asked you that I didn't? Or anything else you want to talk about? No, um, no, this was great. I um, I do want to reemphasize though. Uh, the so the track, the track stuff. That's that's my next hurrah. Mm -hmm. Like that's that's the next thing. That one was build out an investment bank and grow it. We're still doing it. It's, it's not like that's like a side project. It's it's still the main thing. But the next hurrah is to build out uh, a, a track and field investment company, uh, providing financing and, and, and creating um, new uh, opportunities, whether it's the way of expanding on existing meets or uh, helping create a new league. Like that's, 
I am uh, wholly invested into it. It's it's exciting. It's fun. It's fun. I mean, I'm I'm uprooting my entire family yeah. to be closer to that to, to where everything's happening at to to carry that on. And you know, most importantly, more than anything, it's gonna be uh, very fulfilling for my son to to come up and to see that his dad, you know, just the story, mm -hmm. just the just the story of it all. It's uh, uh, I I think it's a historic run to be us that uh, um that I'm currently on. And I want to keep building on it because it'd be easy just to, to coast off just with the investment bank and like just just to just to you know to ride off that because it's a whole thing in and of itself. And that's after you know the, the professional mm -hmm. career. Um, but I want to keep building on it and then build on it in a way that's actually fruitful. The investment banking is cool. Yeah, we're doing things that enhance entrepreneurship, but it's hard to communicate it because people don't really know. They don't they don't really know what investment banking is. But now you know, investing into the sport, uh, track and field, is more tangible. Like, it's, you can't miss that. It's, it's going to be right. It's going to be more in your face. So uh, to be able to do all of that after competing in it at the highest level, uh, I, I think it's cool shit it's for, like, your son to look up and, you know, that's all they know from their dad. I mean, what, what's more cooler than that? Yeah. If, if I may say so myself, <laughs> like, it, it, it's, it's cool. It's cool. So I might be misquoting here, but I think I, I remember you saying, I'm doing a text somewhere where it said, nothing gets you if you're UTSA, UT Pyramid Base, or UT Brand School, but you're not the University of Texas. Correct. Having said that, would you ever consider like expanding your UT Austin track things you're doing, like the, the branch UT schools? Perhaps. Um, perhaps. I mean, this is very, uh, this, yeah, yeah. I mean, because at the end of the day, I mean, these are, I mean, I'm, I'm Texas Longhorn. I love. I love my school. I I, I talk shit with the best of them because I, I I love Texas. Is what it is. Um, but at the end of the day, it's it's to enhance the sport. Mm -hmm. Um, at at the starting at the amateur level and to the professional level, no matter where, where you went to school, it, it doesn't it doesn't matter where you went to school at. Uh, it it just it, it's easier for me to execute it first at Texas. Okay. Um, which is in my backyard. Yeah. Um, but if there's a way that we can grow it and scale it, um, then definitely for it. Okay. Um, same with high school. Because we'll start, we'll do the same exact thing with my high school. But not Texas A&M though, right? Definitely not, not Texas a &M. <laughs> So th there's a, there's a, uh, there, there's an understanding there. It, it was inferred that A&M, you know. Would I be included? You know, A&M, they're interesting. I don't, I don't think, I think it's fun for like the, the tweets and stuff, mm -hmm. but I don't think UT really beats uh, like ha have issues with OU. Like, yeah, not not really. I mean, yeah. yes, it's a rivalry game, but it is what it is. Yeah, and them, we genuinely don't like. Yeah, it's like we're almost like I hate almost. Yeah, yeah, we we, we genuinely like, Texas OU like. is more like respectful competition. You know, you know. Yeah. Okay. Oh, you got us this year. You got us next year. Whatever. A and M is like yeah, it's like more more personal, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and oddly enough, Tennessee, they fancy themselves as being the real UT. It's mm -hmm. Like. What? I was I was where, talking to a guy. Where did that come from? Like, I don't, how is that possible? I don't know. They they're delusional. Yeah. I mean, when you're in like a flower state and no one knows who you are, you got to yeah. hang on to something. But yeah. I was talking to a guy. He asked me to go to Texas. I was like, which is a weird question to ask when you just met. Yeah. And I was like, yeah. And he was like, I went to Tennessee. I was like, okay. Okay. And he was like, uh, we're the real UT. I was like, I was like, brother, you do not like want to have this conversation. Yeah. And he go he goes off into like odd facts. He's like, you know, we were founded in this year. And I was like, dog, come on. This is this is Tennessee. You know, like no one in their right mind. You you I mean, you just yell off the top of the building, what school is UT? No one's saying Tennessee. No, no one. No one. It's and, and no, no disrespect to them, but are we really having this conversation? I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Um, but yeah. I don't like I don't like Tennessee, but I don't like Tennessee. But I hate it. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm looking forward. That's our last game this season. Yeah. So, if like, what's a game you want to go to? Like, where Texas is gonna play? Maybe this or next. Like, you know, would you like? Do you really want to go see Texas at Alabama? Texas at Georgia? Like, what's the environment you like? You want to go see LSU? LSU? Yeah. Yeah, that'd be a good one. Yeah. Yeah, I like LSU. Yeah. I I I, I like the. The culture of LSU. Yeah. I'm a fan of LSU too. Yeah. Yeah. It it, it seemed. I mean, that's real smash mouth Southern football. Mm -hmm. I, I I love that. 
I, I would do that. That'd be crazy. Texas at LSU. Yeah. Actually, all these games at sea are like freaking crazy. Like, there's no bye weeks. It's, it's no. like I mean, we thought like Vanderbilt yeah. of the world, or, but there's I mean, no bye week. Oh, I mean, all the all the games could be like highlight games. Oklahoma at Alabama. Oklahoma at Auburn. You know. Yeah. Um, even 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 Kentucky. Like, yeah. you can't go into that by like, expecting them not to no. play you. You know what's crazy? I think right now, Florida is the Vanderbilt of the SEC right now. Yes, they are. Which which is funny to say. Yeah. yeah. Florida's available at SEC, yeah. Yeah. I'd say a school that I don't want to play right now. That's Ole Miss. Ole Miss? Oh, yeah. Because you don't know what version of them you're going to no. get on that day. And you, Lane Kiffin is... You can get the Kentucky version of loss or the one yeah. that stopped South Carolina. Exactly. Exactly. And you, you just don't know. And they are they are big, fast. I mean, that's football. They, they're yeah. big, fast. And they Nick Stevens said that one time. He was like, Miss, Ole Miss always has the athletes outside. Now they have the athletes inside. Mm -hmm. They have the athletes inside to compete with us in Georgia now. They mm -hmm. never had that before. Yeah, then Kevin was finally able to recruit them to Ole Miss. Yeah, yeah, and and they do, they, they do weird stuff too. Yeah, it, I just like Lake Kev. I just like the way he trolls people. What that he the, does? You see what he do? He does with the injury report. He puts no. like twenty five players up there. And it's <laughs> like you don't know. You can't take it serious. And yeah, then like they, they'll fake injuries in the game. Yeah, like, I'm not even mad at it. Mm -hmm. I'm not even mad at it because yeah. I already know the rules are gonna come to to get rid of that. Yeah. But he's like he's a guy. You just you don't you don't know. Yeah. And I would hate to play Ole Miss when they have a chip on their shoulder. Yeah. After their loss, now they have something to prove. Yeah. And um, I just, I don't want to, I know LSU's playing them this week. Oh, wow. And yeah. That's going to be a game. It's, yeah, it's like insane. Every game is like must win. Like, yeah. 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 I, I want nothing to do with, 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 with Ole Miss. And um, I, I don't take that. No. They got to do it again. You don't have any more, type, I mean, the Cotton Bowl thing is a Saturday. After that, any like any like, does Alabama does Alabama who goes to Texas this year? It's Alabama, Georgia, I think. Uh, Georgia, Georgia, okay, yeah, yeah, and that'd be a good game. There's a lot riding on that too. But Georgia now has a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, and um, I, I no, I don't because I've seen it in track. I don't want to, I don't want to face anybody that has a chip on their shoulder. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna run with heart. And yeah, I just I want the version of a team or a person that's like a shell of themselves mm -hmm. that that's not, that has doubt in them. That then I, I want I don't want them. If angry. Texas does not win the national championship, is it, is the seating a failure for them? Yeah, okay. absolutely. Uh, every year, okay. um, th that would never not be the case. Okay, um, and we will hold them accountable to that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm not like yes, I'm, I'm a diehard Texas fan, but I'm not just saying it because of that. It's because I lived it when, when I ran there. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that's the standard that that we hold everything to at Texas. That's it's it's championship or or bust. Here's one for you. I already know how you answer. Let's suppose hypothetical Texas and Texas and M plays Georgia for the national championship. Mm -hmm. You go, who are you going for? What do you mean? That's a trick question. No, Texas. No, Texas A and M and Georgia. Oh, oh, Texas A and M and Georgia. Yeah. Oh, Georgia. Georgia that's what I thought. E yeah. Easily. Yeah. That's yeah. yeah. There, there is no. That's what I thought, yeah. No. There's no, no way in the world you could ever like no. play Texas A and M. No, I, I would. Um, I don't like. I, there would never be a scenario in which I want to okay. see AM win. So I'm guessing you have no maroon clothes or whatever, no. they, whatever the AM colors is. You have no none no, of that. No, that that, that stink, <laughs> like dirty. No, no, no. Purple is not, no. Um, I don't like AM. Yeah. I don't like AM. And I'm being mindful even when I say that because yeah. I know people that I ran against that yeah. were there. But um, it's, only, no, yeah. it's just not a. Because even funny. though like the football team didn't, didn't play them, we were still running against yeah. them. Yeah. Because track doesn't. Yeah. Track conferences only matter at your conference championship. Okay. So, like, before then, you, you race anybody. Yeah. Because right? different teams go to different meets. Okay. But then, for conference, then you race your conference. Mm. And uh, we didn't race them at conference. This was not the school. Yeah. I, I wish we did, though. But it'd be interesting to see how things play out now. Yeah. Um, I know Coach Flo at Texas. He's um he's the man. Uh, I love him. He, he's, he's a great he's a great man. He's just a great guy. And he... uh. He wasn't my coach. He came right after I got done at mm -hmm. Texas. He came there and like turned everything up even more. So I'm, I'm interested to see how how things go now at yeah. SECs for track too. Yeah, it'd be it'd be it'd be fun to watch. Well, one thing fun about the SEC, people talk about Oklahoma, Texas going to the SEC, all the football stuff. But people forget, like you know, I think didn't Texas really win the like, NCAA championship in volleyball, stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, Oklahoma won like four straight softball, female championships, right? So there's more than football, right? All this. And, and our baseball team. Oh yeah, baseball team is always like yeah. And we we yeah. uh we grabbed a few people from A and M's team. Mm -hmm. 
Um, then y'all yeah. still your coaches? They're still the AM coach or something? Yeah. No, we get a lot of hate. And I'm not even saying it's unjustified, but we get a lot of hate for the way the uh, the AD does business because mm -hmm. he got flow from Kentucky. Mm -hmm. Um. And if it, so, we're known for poaching like yeah. coaches and yeah. actually specifically coaches. I mean, back in the day, y'all poached Mac Brown from North Carolina. Yeah. Way back in the day, yeah, yeah, and they're not doing too well now. No, not not <laughs> at all. No, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. Yeah, you know they still love Mac Brown. Too, yeah, like that. he he um he's a legend there. Yeah, even though he came from North Carolina, he was like the perfect Texas coach. Right, he had the folksy manner. You know, hey, how you're doing? Right, you know, just fit in there so good. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mac Brown's a guy. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, so anything else you want to talk about? No, we're good. Okay, cool. Um, I have to, I have to use the bathroom though. Yeah, we're about to wrap up right now. Any, so I'll, I'll put your social media links into the um, show notes and stuff. Okay. Um, is there a bathroom on this floor? Yeah, All you right. got to use these keys right here. It's here. Yeah. It's right there. Is this space outside? It's still the post office. Yeah, that's the post office next door. Oh, yeah. okay, okay. That's so interesting. I thought it was a window behind. No. So what's behind? That's that's a, like a wood. That's a window with like wood on it and stuff. All right. All right. So that's our talk with Byron Robinson. Um, thanks for your time today, watching this, um, and remember to be great every day.